Українська мова 1, 2, 3. Українська мова. Українська мова 1, 2, 3. 1. One, two, three. Oop.
Добрий день. Є звук? Мене чутно? Пане Ігор, нас, здається, не чує. Пане Ігоре, а зараз чутно? Так, ну в нас, перепрошую, технічні проблеми з паном Ігорем. Я думаю, ми е, повернемо, вирішимо їх, до нього повернемося. Тоді давайте, може, перейдемо. Пане Дмитро, якщо можна до вас, е, я тоді перейду відразу до другої частини вашого брифу, да, особливо враховуючи те, що ви приймаєте зараз участь в створенні стратегії 2030, да, е, і, напевно, можете нам найкраще розповісти ось про якесь своє бачення порядку денного реформ для України зараз. Ну, дійсно, дякую, Павло. Радий тут бути, радий вітати всіх учасників панелі і наших слухачів. На даний момент уряд України почав розробку національної економічної стратегії, яка включає в себе чотири основні етапи. Перший етап – це відновлення довіри, другий етап – це конкуренція за капітал, Третій етап – це конкуренція за ринки, і четвертий – це конкуренція за людський розвиток. Насправді, будучи активним учасником реанімаційного пакету реформ, ми завжди говорили про важливість економічних реформ, важливість структурних реформ, але в різні часи ми мали успіхи, ми мали поразки, деякі реформи починалися, деякі реформи були реалізовані не так, як, як нам хотілося, і зараз є хороший момент для консолідації модератора, Ось, уряду, бізнесу, для реалізації тих економічних реформ, яких потребує економіка України. Не секрет для всіх, що пандемія і глобальна економічна криза, вони нанесли... Well, the plan is uh, actually very holistic and comprehensive. 
I think it's going to be passed and approved in the first quarter next year. And undoubtedly, this is going to be an important step, step forward in implementing economic reforms and also defining the long term vector for the economic growth in Ukraine. Thank you, Dmitro. Unfortunately, Igor uh, is not yet with us. I mean, we cannot hear him. But can we then ask you, Vlip, if you can tell us about the most important part of your brief where you made a survey about the Ukraine's at Ukrainian's attitude to the reforms. The figures were quite brand new for me, and I'm actually quite aware of the reform agenda and the situation, how people understand it. Can you share some of the, this information? Thanks very much, Pablo. Allow me to start with the more on the assessment side and tell you about the situation since the fall last year, because that was the key part of this brief and our assessment as well. And then I'm going to come back to the survey itself. Several days ago, I checked the macroeconomic reports of one of the investment banks, and my first reaction was, how could government never take advantage of such extraordinary opportunities which are available right now? We have now uh, the imports and exports ratio right now, and this situation is the best one since 2013. For a while, we've had the best current account situation in the country, and we're still uh, not taking advantage of this. At the same time, the Hrivnia exchange rate is falling down, and um, normally we have the biggest challenging situation in December, but this year we already had it in early September. How come we have such a difficult situation right now? Well, when a year ago, uh, the Ukrainian government has been implementing record-breaking reforms in terms of their pay. And in the fall last year, uh, the reform pace was very, very swift. Even though it was poorly efficient for the economy, as it was passed by the parliament, but it was quite a remarkable discovery for the agriculture market is actually the uh, lifting Abolishment of the list of companies that were banned for privatizations had been banned. Uh, also, privatization of the alcohol industry, Eucharist spirits. Portfolio investors started investing into the uh, um, government the bonds. And we only had several steps to be made to the success of foreign direct FBI. But then uh, there was a lot of publicity that it's nothing about efficiency, it's not anything that we have to do. And now the COVID-19 crisis uh, forced the government to pass the land reform. Together with the adaptive uh, lockdown, we recovered quickly after the drop down in spring and they expected 2.5% growth will be overperformed, um, unlike in many other economies. Okay, the, the, their economy will shrink uh, by 11%. This is the worst situation over the last 300 years, but the future looks quite bright. However, uh, hope, the hopes for quick recovery from the crisis are still quite vague. But, um, this year, instead of uh, three facilities from the IMF, we received only one, which limited the government's uh, capacity to incentivize the economy and fight the crisis. And Ukraine not only ranks number one as the biggest obstacle to FDI, but also disrupted economic stability through the decisions, due to the decisions of the Constitutional Court. No major privatization ever happened. 
only Hotel Dnipro was privatized successfully, which for me is not yet clear who the ultimate beneficiary is. There are three major companies in the agricultural sector are out of the privatization list. The corrupt managers are coming back, putting back their control over those companies. At the same time, the independent supervision, the supervisory board members uh, are actually dismissed sometimes. Unmotivated replacement of the um, central bank governor created a lot of challenges and this still creates risks for the country's financial stability. And the Ministry of Finance, instead of be being the goal goalkeeper uh, or gatekeeper of financial stability, um, has instead developed unrealistic indicators for the next year's budget and the deficit isn't realistic either. At the same time, endless hopes to recover are quite vague right now because already over the last 10 months, uh, over the next 10 months, we're going to have the peak financial load because we have to actually redeem some of those um, ma major payments to repay the loans. And I think we're sick and tired of this for the last 30 years. It's frank, not actually developed successfully this way. Hopefully the national strategy 2030 will be a better one. But how, how, how can we have the strategy developed properly if we're talking about a default situation financially every single year? Uh, nor we can actually handle properly the IMF facility and our standby program. What do we have to do to make sure the economy recovers? Something has been said already. We need to ensure macro stability, macroeconomic stability that we're struggling for every year with the, any president, whoever there is in office. There is also FDI attraction, human capital development, and the foundation to that is the integration to the EU and rule of law. As for the survey itself, then there are still issues about that. This is actually an individual trend that is handled by both government and civil society. And we can see a lot of stereotypes there meaning that the government and the Ministry of Economy have been trying to deregulate prices, for instance, over the last two years for more than 80%, more than 80% of Ukrainians believe the food product, food prices have to be still set by the state. Same has to be happening with privatization where we have the whole bundle of uh, understandings that are contradictory to each other. The majority of Ukrainians are convinced that the state-owned company managers are corrupt, that even if a, an individual employee comes to a private company to work, it's much better than going to a state-owned enterprise. Privates are much more efficient than the state-owned ones. At the same time, the majority of Ukrainians believe that no privatization should happen with the state-owned enterprises, but we need to actually employ successful managers who have been hiding somewhere for the last 30 years. That's why there was a management first. Actually, being focused on those impressions and beliefs are never based on the real people's experience. People have real experience with healthcare, education, use they can make their own evaluation of how policies are implemented and working in those sectors. But as for the economic policy, privatization, things that have to do with the land market, very few Ukrainians have understanding about that because very few Ukrainians really own their land, even for agricultural purposes. So we need to actually start changing the mindset to actually eliminate those contradictions in there regarding the economic performance. This will contribute to everyone, to the government, policymakers, and civil society. Thank you. Thank you, Vlieb. I understand Igor Burakovsky is not yet connected. I am there. I am there. So we have heard um, I believe Vyshlinsky information that he wanted to share regarding what's going on in the reform agenda. And obviously the survey data 
has shown that those comprehensive reforms are not well understood by the society while people uh, exercise their own experience and stereotypes. And some of those still last from Soviet Union times. They're still very much linked to planned economy. But the market-based based reforms are not yet understood by the broader public. So, of course, privatization has to be more contemporary state of the art as well as the economic world. Alexander, I never wanted to ask you to speak on behalf of the Ministry of Economy. This would not be quite just. Because some, somewhere we have win-win situations, somewhere else there are failures. But maybe you can actually reflect on some of those agenda items that Dmitro just mentioned, as well as Lieb. I understand you're working with IPR, and maybe you can reflect on the situation in general and specifically tell a bit more about your subject matter engagement. Yes, the reflections have to be up there, and this format actually creates a lot of opportunities to discuss that given the workload the government is actually having today. Looking back and looking up from, we need to understand where the situation is. The government still continues the initiated reforms that have been out there for a while are we keep moving and we're actively engaged into the strategy 2030 development where we specifically take part in that development and i believe this is a very strong consolidating tool for different expert communities and community leaders as well as businesses and mps and government officials this is a kind of uh, platform which finally, because I'm, I've been observing these political developments, it's the first time ever when all these stakeholders are building together this course, Ukraine's course, and this is a good sign, isn't it? So the level of detail that the strategy contains already is quite high. I mean, we can already see some of the KPIs, the strategy, is measurable and there is something that's something that we had been missing before we only had slogans directives but now we have specific figures and apis that are measurable this is my reflection about the strategy that we that is in the pipeline now regarding those areas that you that i'm personally responsible for and i'm responsible for primarily exports the Ukraine's exports, like Philippe just mentioned, the situation is looking like we have to grow our export potential, but unfortunately, we are still very much dependent on raw material export. So right now, it is the objective to radically change the export composition or mix to encourage more added value products to explore them. Uh, this can be high tech product exports, and for this, we have all the preconditions. Why that is so important? Like the colleagues already mentioned here, there is competition for resources, of course, for talents as well, and investment. And this competition is taking place not even the state or national level and not even at the regional level but it's actually taking place on the ground at the local level that are trying to attract investment and talent talents for this we need to win the battle to relocate businesses from the oriental market because many companies are now transferring their had offices from Europe to Asia, and with the Swiss Confederation Federation of Small and Medium Businesses that amounts 300,000 small and medium businesses, and it's 
just like 500 to half a million of them in Switzerland. I was, we were asking like, what would you suggest to our companies to do that you want to actually transfer some of the businesses? They consider Romania, Poland, Romania, Ukraine. That's the first time we ever heard this. And we actually told them this. Okay, we have industrial parks. They are successful in Pilar Perkla, the region. We actually show them still the draft, but it's a draft on substantial investment. Hopefully it's going to be passed. In the, it's going to pass the second reading that when it's over 20 million euros, it's going to be 30% compensation. Number three, the level of talent and IT expertise are so much developed. These are the three components that you seem to have flipped. And therefore, we started inviting them and they started requesting more and more information about specific industrial parts. Uh, and we established tangible certification over, over the following two weeks. They started already discussing the issue about the placement and expansion of their um, manufacturing capacities and in, in um, employing more people. This is just a small example, but uh, that's what the government actually put as an objective. We need to fight for the talent. We not only have to tell about our problems, but also about our capabilities and capacity in this world to attract more investment. I'm going to just picture this situation with thick brush strokes. But anyways, we have a lot of changes going on. This is a topic for a separate discussion. I can speak about this for hours. But here is another case about uh, geographical indicators. It's the first time ever this year that Ukraine actually approved three geographical indicators. Hutel Brinza, which is like feta cheese, and sweet cherry, I couldn't even hear the name. So next year, we need to, to approve 10 of such geographical indicators. It's first on watermelons, and, and so those are different categories that everybody has, has been aware of, but we need to make sure we protect them in Europe. You may ask, what, is, what does it have to do with the reforms? No, but the reforms start with those little steps. If you have the long-term vision, then you take little steps to reach it. A lot of resources are spent for wildfire fighting. But, I mean, uh, that's, an, that's a... Uh, but the stakeholders have to know about that and focus yeah. on this. Then they're going to have success. This, that was a metaphor. Okay, Mr. Ihor is already with us. Maybe you can say something. One, two, three. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Hooray. Welcome. Igor. Right now, Leap Wyszlinski shared some of the information about uh, this survey and the overall situation in the last year. You're probably the most experienced person in this panel. You've seen a lot in this in, in, in the lifetime. You observe so many reforms and political modalities. But anyways, um, I would like to ask you to please reflect on what's going on right now. What's that? Are we moving forward or have we stopped? Or are we rolling back, backwards? Can you just draw the picture of today uh, from the bird view? Yeah, it's really difficult to do that from the bird view because I'm sitting at home right now, things are connecting me. And I live on the fourth floor, so my bird view is relative. Yeah, it's like a sparrow view. But now, as for the present day situation, I think the full dip with his thick brush strokes actually has shown the today's picture. I would like to briefly uh, mention three major things. First of all, the COVID-19 crisis, and this is a central problem today. However, it seems to me that we don't have to forget about fighting the COVID-19 with all those humanitarian, social, and economic, as well as healthcare challenges that we have to fix 
together with the traditional, running the traditional economic policy. That's number one. Here it seems to me that sometimes we are a bit over exaggerating things and uh, leave everything for COVID and try to actually um, complain that that's because of COVID every time. That's my first statement. The second statement is that in general, we need, we have a little bit of a slowdown in our economic transformation. There are many reasons for that. And it seems to me that the government needs, uh, has very easy on the one hand, and at the same time, very difficult mission. We have to defend what has been done already. And unfortunately, in some of the areas, we still observe uh, the situation rolling backwards. We, we talk about state-owned enterprises and banks. There are many other challenges on the way, but let us defend the public procurement system for Zorro, because there are a lot of problems with it, and the problems are, unfortunately, uh, getting even worse. I'm going to be sharing only details about that, but we can see that Prozoro itself needs to be upgraded and it needs to be protected. And due to COVID crisis today, that's getting even worse, but we're also uh, forgetting about the strategic financial planning at the national level. We need to also switch to the midterm budget planning, but actually we, we don't have that yet. That's another statement, statement that I'd like to share. And of course, we're going to discuss each and every one. I think we pay very little attention to the interaction between the center and the regions. This is kind of a brand new problem because we uh, have completed the decentralization process. We have a different administrative and territorial setting right now and distribution of power. Nearly we're still a uni uh, unitary country, but there are still many things that require developing new policies from the central government, and also the policies have to be developed there on the ground in the region. And if we look at the situation around COVID and the measures that are taken to incentivize economic growth and business, they normally were uh, actually uh, instructed from the center. Nevertheless, at the local level, they normally try to protect the people, which was right, but in many cases, they never try to lever something like uh, leverage, I mean, the use of the local taxes, uh, Levi's. And there is another point that I wanted to underline today. Presently, it seems to me we are losing the dynamic uh, in cooperation with our international partner. This issue is not only about IMF, but this is also about the European Union. Clearly, we have problems that the European Union is facing right now, as well as we do. But it seems to me this is a negative trend. For us, cooperation with the IMF is not only about money. We've been cooperating with uh, the IFIs because they are providing us with cheap money. But the IMF helps us, has been helping us to actually keep up the tone. And that is really important, I understand. And if we actually start discussing something generic and summarize everything in the today's situation, I think we're missing many things, but to the biggest extent, we are missing uh, this perception of what is really going on. The pandemic has shown that we have switched to working in home offices remotely, and this is a new challenge for the labor market because the labor market is governed by the labor code, and the labor code that is now discussed in the parliament to be uh, aligned with the current reality. We need not only to uh, troubleshoot, but also we need to look soberly at what's going on and think about how we want to move forward. And last but not least, I wanted to tell you something about the strategy that is in the pipeline today. And I would like to mention two major papers. The first one is the country's economic audit. 
I believe this is a very ambitious name and headline, but we could call, call it that way even. But I would like to mention the issue of the vision for economic development. With my uh, professional interest, I checked the economic policy chapter and right away, I want to tell you that I would be scared if I were an international investor for two reasons. Everywhere they're talking that we need to revisit and create mechanisms to revisit our international treaties that Ukraine had undersigned. Uh, we need to see what's going on about the free trade agreements. We need to also change all our do customs duties and everything that has to do with that. Well, I'm, I'm trying to actually raise the tone, but anyway, there are so many issues. There are so many provisions that always, where the key word is change, revisit, revise, review, and everything. I would be scared being an investor. If we want to be talking about the issues of the bilateral agreements, free trade, this, this is a challenging thing. So if, if that's the government's opinion that we need to actually revisit our four economic activities and treaties, I think this is quite dangerous, technically. On the other hand, I do not yet have clear understanding how this will work regarding the markets. And apparently I'm gonna stop there. I think FTA and free trade in general is really important because due to the pandemic and uh, the export that has shrunk, we not only need to actually pursue strategic market, but all the markets where we can supply our products to, there are no small or large markets today. All the markets are important right now. As for the national manufacturers protection, I have such a slogan, well, sounds like a toast, exports is imports. There is no exports without imports. So the, the idea is about that we need to develop, support, develop strategic markets, etc. They sound very attractive, but normally those ideas are sometimes dangerous and very often they're limited to creating even bigger problems in the relations with our international partners. These are the three statements of mine. So to summarize, first of all, I believe indeed we have to focus on macroeconomic stability. And here we have kind of ambiguous situation. Some of the indicators where we're gonna have much less performance, 2.4% is a separate discussion topic. And uh, we have more or less inflation, stable inflation and exchange rate situation. And the issue that has to do with uh, uh, the redemptions and external debts, uh, given we're taking even, uh, even, given the debts are growing today, has to be well thought about. Institutional development is, in, is, a, is the number two issue. We need to really develop strong institutions. Like it was mentioned already today, we need to review or revise the public administration reform. First of all, in the part that has to do with what the government is supposed to be. But a third statement, maybe it's highly politicized, but it seems to me if we take the constitutional situation, etc. the government is kind of staying in the shade because we have the parliament and the president that are outright, but we have, we, I think our government needs to be much more independent and more proactive. Without this proactive uh, state, we will probably fail to perform and against all the economic plans and objectives. And last, last, last thing, it's really difficult, but if we look at the today's situation in other countries, we can see that there is no other way but just to combine the current agenda with the pandemic and also if, if importantly enough to make uh, short-term and long, uh, sorry, mid-term and long-term decisions for the future. Thank you, Mr. Igor. Metro and Alexander were willing to answer. Thank you for such a thorough detail analysis. Ukraine now is a very interesting situation. Last year, we attracted uh, millions of uh, investments from and around 15 millions uh, were transferred abroad. 
and it's an adequate situation for the economy which is willing to develop. Thus, the fundamental issue is the attraction of the direct investments from abroad and from inside and also uh, to facilitate uh, the export from Ukraine. If we speak about the foreign economic relations, we are speaking about the renewal of uh, the association agreement with the EU and uh, a huge number of ministries are working on this, that Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Economic Development, the Office of the Vice Prime Minister on the Euro-Atlantic Integration. A huge number of people are involved in this process, and it's a topical issue right now in the, in the, the foreign economic policy. We are not speaking about the revisiting uh, the other uh, agreements, but uh, to make the strategy of uh, the economic activities uh, more than so, which uh, ends uh, in 2021. So we have to indicate the priorities uh, in the new strategy. So if we're speaking about the international trade, we have <coughs> to provide uh, the cycle and to increase the, the institutional capacity. And I can see uh, some important element. The first one is the Office for Expert Facilitation, which uh, provides uh, the information uh, and uh, support. And uh, yesterday, the agreement was signed with the first Commercial Bank Credit West, and the Expert Credit Agency will be assisting uh, assisting Ukrainian exporters, and it's called the Suppliers Credit. We are, cannot think about buyer's credit, so we're starting with the supplier's uh, credit by having some incentives uh, for the expert uh, and uh, of the program five, seven, and nine, uh, which was very efficient uh, by attracting a higher number of banks. And then the trade diplomacy, and which is a very important moment, Ukraine should be selling its goods abroad and should attract uh, the investments. This narrative of the foreign economic uh, trade um, should be looking like this. We are not speaking about the, uh, revisiting uh, the agreements with our strategic partners. We are just speaking about the renewal of the association agreement with the EU and also to have uh, our companies represented in international markets. And uh, to this narrative, uh, I will give some examples. So, so expert agency, which is under my supervision, when I saw how this uh, agency was looking like when uh, I came to the position, and in half a year we had such a huge progress, and we haven't increased the uh, capitalization and only 22 people are employed. What do we have? Yesterday, the private bank signed. So in fact, we have three banks which were attracted to this program. We have 250 million dollars plus it, the, the amount of contracts uh, which are willing to be signed uh, with uh, the agency uh, to have the insurance, to have to, to be secured. So when uh, we're coming to the regions, the Tomer, Lviv regions, and we'll see how business needs uh, those tools of support. So we uh, do not know uh, how to protect uh, our producers at the international markets and support is another step. We are only starting to do this. So when we are speaking about this tool, we see how huge the demand is. And so we are reacting in the way uh, we have already the asset allocations for the agency for the next year. And we have the list of products bigger and we are supporting strategically the enterprises which have a value added which is higher. And we had the meetings with different representatives of interest in this from agriculture, machine building, and around the round table, we received uh, the requests 
what types of products and what types of securization uh, they need. So it's not like we invaded by ourselves. These are very specific requests from the specific business. Uh, and uh, thus, uh, we are drafting uh, those tools. And as soon as we introduce them, they are starting using them. Paul, I would like to react. Uh, I've heard two very interesting topics. One is that the private sector against the state sector. That's uh, uh, the second topic, which is uh, attraction of the investments. And uh, um, I think that two our speakers can tell us about this. Though it is, um, I see that you have the presentation. Should I switch to Russian? You have the presentation, which is linked to, to the uh, bankruptcy procedures and the inequality of procedures to state uh, uh, and uh, public uh, enterprises. So let's have a look. Yes, please uh, they share the presentation on the screen. Yes, I called my presentation moratorium and uh, finding uh, the private sector. There are a number of issues. Uh, and I collected the numbers uh, which are known to um, almost all of you. So, so we're doing a business at every moment and um, indicator uh, for any country, for any political party. And we can see that uh, Ukraine is uh, on the 146 uh, in the list and uh, 63 ranking uh, on the implementation of the contracts, which is in fact linked to the enforcement system. And both uh, numbers show that we should do a lot of steps to improve the situation about the bankruptcy. We can hope that the rating will grow because we know that last year the new co bankruptcy code uh, was adopted and uh, the first association uh, of uh, the bankruptcy trustees uh, was established at the level of microdynamics. We can see a very good dialogue between the bankruptcy trustee, which is an independent profession, and the Ministry of Justice as a regulator. And we hope that in the bankruptcy, uh, we will have some progress about the enforcement of the rulings and the decision of the private enforcement officers, which uh, was introduced three years ago, and which shows, according to the, the um, statistic of the uh, Ministry of Justice, uh, five more times efficient than the state uh, uh, enforcement service. And uh, still uh, not uh, all of the steps are taken by the MOJ, and this uh, does not allow the private enforcement officers to work in the full force. And uh, the debt, which was not uh, collected around 25% uh, of the GDP of the country. And uh, we compare uh, this with other European jurisdictions, uh, that there is a huge issue in Ukraine with this. We have uh, to have a better dialogue uh, between uh, Ministry of Justice and the private enforcement officers uh, who proved uh, to be efficient in collecting the debts. But another, another issue, these are the debts of the state enterprises. And uh, here we have issues more complicated than the powers of the private enforcement officers. And even the private enforcement officers cannot uh, assist when we start solving the issue of uh, moratorium. It's a number of the state enterprises, as the statistics uh, shows, uh, 3,600 
if we compare with the uh, OECD, 21 in Denmark, 47 in uh, Finland, 48 in uh, Lithuania, 71 in Germany, and 126 in Poland. We can see uh, the difference, but we can see uh, that the difference in numbers uh, is hundreds times. So when we are speaking about uh, 3,600 and the, the municipal companies are not included in this number. And uh, if calculated uh, also with the local, then it will be around uh, 17,000. So uh, if we also calculate uh, the number of employees at the state enterprises, uh, then Ukraine will be um, very different from uh, other countries. So we do not have any proofs that Ukraine believes in uh, the uh, private sector and the market economy. Uh, so at the uh, macroideological level, there is an issue. What are the examples? So why I showed the number of the state enterprises? Because the state enterprises are the key beneficiaries of the moratorium. And we calculated 14 moratoriums which uh, are um, in force uh, and they are all, uh, they have been on for uh, around 20 uh, years. There are some examples, for example, if you are a state enterprise and your essence, it could not uh, be uh, arrested, seized, except uh, the uh, assets uh, which uh, are on your bank accounts. So uh, your real estate cannot be arrested and sold. Uh, uh, the equities cannot uh, uh, and shares cannot be uh, sold. And uh, also your technical equipment, hardware, cannot uh, be seized as well. Uh, that's a moratorium which uh, gives uh, for uh, the state debtors uh, better advantages uh, than uh, the private entities. Uh, the state shares uh, cannot go into the bankruptcy, except Ukroboron Prom, which is an exception from last year and it can restructure uh, the um, enterprises uh, during the rehabilitation uh, plan. And we have uh, also the institutional uh, issues. The uh, state assets uh, fund is doing the work which uh, could have been done by the bankruptcy trustees. That's why uh, we have also the institutional challenges. And uh, the issue is that, that state enterprises uh, cannot have the rehabilitation uh, plan in the bankruptcy procedure, except uh, some exceptions. And recently, uh, the moratorium of the last year, the enforcement of the state enterprises where the assets uh, um, are more than 50% was stopped, so the state enterprises are not in the register of debtors. And de facto, we can see that the court rulings against the, the state enterprises are disappearing from the registry of court rulings. So uh, you should make a number of effort uh, to, to find out whether the state enterprise is a debtor or if there have uh, been uh, some court uh, rulings. That's why a huge issue of transparency uh, exists. And uh, thus, the state enterprises uh, have um, uh, advantages comparing to the private enterprises. And their competitiveness uh, thus can be higher. At the end, I can also say that besides the legal moratorium, we have, have the uh, judicial uh, court moratorium, and that the position of the Supreme Court about uh, seizing uh, the uh, banking accounts uh, after the uh, ruling of the Supreme Court uh, in May this year, the situation became a bit clearer, but still the Supreme Court uh, received uh, some windows of opportunities. Uh, 
and our legal experts are afraid that this will uh, still um, keep the possibility for some uh, unlawful uh, debtors uh, to stop the enforcement procedure or to escape uh, their debts. So it will be complicated to, to see the, the banking accounts of the enterprises, especially of the state enterprise. So there are different uh, legal arguments which are used by the courts, and I don't think that we need to go into the details right now. But unfortunately, the, the uh, Ukrainian courts uh, didn't understand uh, that seizing uh, the black account and uh, and uh, this uh, is one of the key possibilities uh, to enforce the rulings. And it's a part, a, a fundamental uh, element of the system, which is called rule of law. That's why uh, there are a lot of issues uh, of uh, the uh, system, which is not acting efficiently. So Ecorban Pron is an exception right now. It's not, it's a holding more than 100 companies and 15 uh, companies are um, under the uh, rehabilitation plan and uh, uh, it could be the best practice that the company has uh, to look what is its core business and to pay for some uh, to pay for some debt uh, creditors and uh, to be better focused on its uh, strategic uh, activities. And uh, I think that we should uh, take uh, away this uh, stigma, uh, which is linked to the notion bankruptcy. And to understand that bankruptcy doesn't mean the company is uh, uh, liquidated. It's an attempt uh, to have an audit and to uh, diagnose the patient and then to treat it. And in some cases, uh, this treatment is uh, possible. That's why this uh, sanation, uh, rehabilitation uh, is a very important element of the bankruptcy, except uh, uh, those cases as uh, Ukurban Pron. Uh, this tool is not uh, used uh, effectively for the state enterprises and uh, for the private uh, enterprises as well. So the volume of this, uh, of the usage of this tool uh, should be greater to follow the exams of the European standards. About the uh, European commitments and national commitments, we should look at the moratorium uh, not only as a political issue, but also as a legal uh, one. And uh, there is a number of arguments and facts um, no, that we can claim that moratorium uh, are not uh, legal according to the international uh, conventions and uh, it uh, there could be article 262 uh, of the association agreement and also the practice uh, of the um, court in luxembourg which stipulates any economic privilege which was not gained in the market conditions should not be used by the state. And that's interesting that Luxembourg case law forbids any illegal privileges. And we're speaking about the economic privilege which was created for their own enterprise. That's an additional legal argument about the legal uh, logic of the existence of this notion of moratorium and uh, the European uh, legislative science uh, should be taken into account in Ukraine and such too as a, a macroeconomic uh, assistance program from the EU sets the requirements which will allow the private enforcement officers to act against the stated prices. Right now, they cannot act against the state debtors or state creditors. 
and through this political dialogue with the EU and through the program of the macroeconomic assistance, we will move from the standstill about uh, the issue of the financial debts of the state enterprises. If the market will be open for the private enforcement officers, uh, who show to be five times more efficient but we should uh, be uh, realistic and until uh, the moratorium is on even the private enforcement officer with its independence uh, it will be very complicated to do anything when the state enterprise is um, under the protection of moratorium and the conclusions of which i should do what can we suggest to solve this issue First of all, we need the uh, cross-cutting approach and multi-sectoral one, so the justice uh, could uh, make its input and uh, the state and practice could become more independent uh, and uh, the justice uh, in the uh, countries. Um, which uh, have uh, the rule of law practice, uh, thus providing the transparent and accounting uh, business through the um, effective uh, enforcement. And secondly, that's uh, the fast uh, and clear system of uh, bankruptcy and rehabilitation of an enterprise. So we have uh, some achievements, especially in the area of bankruptcy, and uh, I'm very supportive uh, uh, of the position uh, of the Ministry of Justice, uh, which supports the private enforcement officers. Unfortunately, the uh, dialogue is not that good uh, about uh, the um, uh, state uh, enterprises uh, and uh, private, uh, private uh, enforcement officers' powers. We hope uh, that this dialogue with the EU will uh, allow to work uh, for the interests uh, of uh, the creditors, uh, but uh, for the business itself. As for the separate issue of state enterprises that's a corporate governance and very few steps are being taken there there are different expert uh, uh, evaluations we should uh, to define the uh, positions of the uh, CEOs of uh, the boards of the shareholders so uh, the uh, some work has been doing going on here uh, but still more should be done and then the state procurement system so when we are speaking about independent uh, uh, business how can we make the state uh, business uh, uh, reliable and accountable we should uh, think not only about the privileges for the debt, uh, but also how they are earning money and uh, how the state uh, procurements are being conducted and uh, so how they're being promised and the state uh, enterprises uh, are just waiting for um, some uh, promises uh, uh, which were done by the deputies and uh, those state uh, enterprises are not uh, um, competing with um, private ones while they are just waiting for something. So this uh, state procurement system should be fair and the private uh, business should have the possibility to uh, compete in a fair way. So this uh, PPG, which uh, did not receive uh, uh, the possibility uh, to exist. And it, in the developed jurisdictions where the state uh, has a different approach uh, to uh, state assets uh, through uh, this uh, project uh, approach. So uh, this uh, public-private uh, partnerships uh, can uh, be seen uh, through the uh, through construction of the highways and so on so they uh, this uh, ppp is a different type of uh, philosophy that state and private uh, enterprise are collaborating in a, a short period of time so we hope that the law on uh, 
PPP uh, should uh, come uh, from the paper into the practice. And the key ideological uh, question is whether the politicians are willing to have the market economy and what is the role of the state uh, in the market economy? Should the state be involved? So what is the core business of the state? And we are looking at the developed jurisdictions uh, either on the GDP or, or other standards or the, the uh, rankings in the doing business, uh, there the states are trying uh, to look uh, um, uh, at the regulation as their core business, but not the uh, competition with the uh, private sector in uh, the uh, service sector. Of course, there are some services uh, which should be only in the state sector, and OECD gives us uh, us uh, the possibility to see what are the sectors uh, of the state services which should uh, be uh, only with the state. But those strategic decisions should be taken. So the key question, if the state uh, is staying in business, then we should have uh, similar uh, game rules for everyone. Because while assisting the state sector, we are finding sanctioning the uh, private sector and uh, thus undermining its potential. And especially um, small and medium enterprises who do not uh, have uh, this uh, uh, political uh, support so a number of questions uh, exist, but sometimes I see in the press that the politicians are saying that a huge economic audit of the state should be conducted. But I would like to say to the politicians, our project uh, is a huge one, and it's not the only project uh, which exists in Ukraine. And we are uh, doing a number of researches uh, and uh, all the data exists uh, in those researches of the we are giving uh, enough expert opinions but uh, are you going to use uh, this knowledge so that uh, the uh, task uh, of the pollution is to uh, come to the point of introducing those uh, researches into practice thank you Dovidas, and let's move Forward, we have a second topic that's the attraction of the investments and i believe that we should have a huge diaspora which uh, lives abroad which can uh, play a very important role and we have uh, miss natalia nemeliska she's uh, the head of the committee of the world ukrainian congress this is natalia are you with us good morning Thanks a lot. As I was preparing to this speech at the last point, and I'm thinking in English, I will switch to English, but I will be happy to uh, answer all the questions and to join the discussion in Ukrainian. Uh, good morning, speakers and colleagues. It is very much a pleasure for me to be with you here today. Thank you for the opportunity to address you and provide input towards this discussion from the point of view of the diaspora, which is your global Ukrainian community, um, especially when it comes to the economic reform agenda in Ukraine. Among other things, as has been noted, I'm currently serving as the director of the Economic Prosperity and Investment Committee of the UWC, EPIC in short. We believe that we are EPIC and we can become EPIC for Ukraine. EPIC has been established to advance the economic, investment and business side of the Ukrainian diaspora's engagement with Ukraine. This is a key committee right now in the Ukrainian World Congress, which is the umbrella organization coordinating more than 20 million Ukrainians abroad. We understand very well that economic security is the cornerstone of national security and has been and has and as has been clearly demonstrated by the speakers before me there is a strong understanding and assessment of what ukraine needs to do 
what it should focus on, on the economic reform agenda. Certainly, the debate is still ongoing, as it well should be, through um, a continuous feedback loop. And Ukraine should continue to find optimal, optimal solutions and policies that work for the country and its people. The ability to implement these reforms have obviously been, been impacted by the COVID-19 situation, the, the epidemic. It's evolving, it's a moving target. And so as other panelists have noted, this adds additional layers of complexity when it comes to speaking about the economic reform agenda. So this needs to be factored in now, and it has to be factored in going forward. But on to my short intervention. What I would like to offer you today is not so much more of what has already been communicated. I will not focus on what needs to be done, but I will focus on the how. And I think this is exactly where the Ukrainian diaspora comes into play, and we come in strong. My message number one to you is this. The Ukrainian uh, diaspora is a tw 20 million strong audience for you. Uh, we are your partners and we are a resource for Ukraine and its people. This is my message number one. Next, we are a diverse but connected group. We are intrinsically and emotionally connected to Ukraine. We want Ukraine to succeed and prosper. To put it simple, we are a strategic but still underused group, an audience that you should be engaging and doing so in a systemic manner. And I emphasize the word systemic. My key point to you is this, engage us and use our potential. Start thinking about how we can become strategic agents for Ukraine. My message number two is the following. Do not look at the diaspora as investors exclusively. This is a very short-sighted and quite frankly, a narrow view of potential cooperation and engagement of Ukrainian diaspora into the economy of Ukraine. Investors, wherever they may be and whatever their background is, have the same operating principles. The diaspora is no different. While we, be, we may be less risk averse, we are still looking for security of investment, transparency, and the rule of law. But looking beyond the investment side of things, the diaspora can be instrumental in supporting Ukraine's reforms from so many other angles. Leverage the potential of the Ukrainian diaspora to support and promote your economic reform agenda. Let me just focus on a few possibilities and opportunities. The Ukrainian diaspora can be bridge builders and connectors. We are a diverse and successful group in the countries where we live. We have the contacts, we have the knowledge, we have the ability to reach out to decision makers, influence and help shape economic policy on Ukraine. We can move the dial on securing external financing and grants. We can help advance trade and exports from Ukraine to consumers worldwide. There are countless professional and business associations established by the diaspora. Chambers of commerce, um, trade associations, all of these are focused on Ukraine. Seek them out and work with us. Second, we can advise and provide an additional external viewpoint on your economic reforms. Ukraine's diaspora is highly educated. We are strategists and practitioners and on the whole, we as the diaspora are ready to provide advisory support. Use us as a resource. If you're looking to enhance trade with Australia, for example, and you're developing a strategy and action plan, use us for insight analysis and strategic analysis. Third, we are your communication ambassadors. There are more than 20 million of us abroad. We can serve as your communication ambassadors. While we do this nevertheless already, we can do so much more to promote a contemporary and accurate picture of Ukraine in our countries and communities. Many of us are communication specialists, such as myself, for example, with deep understanding of our home audiences. Use us to craft your message for external audiences and enable us to communicate on Ukraine's behalf. 
So these are just a few ideas to get us thinking about how to engage the diaspora more fully, more deeply, and with greater effect. And I hope that this will be a very good start to um, jumpstart our activity uh, as, as a global community in support of Ukraine, not only in the economic sphere, but more generally and uh, writ large. Thank you very much. Thanks, Natalia. And here's the last speaker in our panel who hasn't yet spoken. It's Alexei Dorohan. So what can BDO tell us? Where is the reform right now? Actually, a lot has been said already about the strategy 2030 is under development. And I've heard a very interesting thing that I would like to talk about is communication and more specifically technical communication. In English, uh, there is a saying which says, talk is cheap. In Ukraine, we have a lot of strategies, programs, visions. There are dozens and or if not hundreds of them, but only one of them was fully implemented in the Ukraine's history. So it's of course important to talk. This is what our colleagues already mentioned, but it's important to talk about what's going on really, what the government is doing, whatever that central bank is doing, parliament and president's office. This is about implementation. So we do have the strategy development and we also have implementation. Unfortunately, historically, those two processes were siloed. They were not linked together. And what we normally talk about rarely uh, is put into practice. If we consider our talks, we do, we can say we have a systemic economic policy. We have the answers to virtually all the questions. We're going to be building the market economy. But when we look at what's going on really in the regulatory framework and uh, public sector, we can see that the implementation is once every six months or once every year has to be adjusted from the economic policy standpoint. Lack of systemic economic policy on the implementation side in the subsequent number of years, it's much better than every economic policy that is changing every year. Unfortunately, that's the symptoms that that's the symptom that we can see. If we're saying we're building market economy, but at the same time, uh, our public sector is not getting reduced and has still privileges and still competes with the private sector in the economy. At the same time, when we're talking about implementation, then of course the implementation challenges are primarily linked to public administration reform that we have talked about today already. So we develop strategies and visions and concept papers for one and the same number of public servants. Um, where with scarce resources, they have very low pay grade, nobody wants to go to work there. So normally they say public service is a place where you can steal things, where you can actually be corrupt. And that implementation normally stumbles over so many different uh, problems like this. We can of course talk about implementation because BRDO has implemented already more than 110 initiatives that has the cumulative effect of over 10 billion hryvnias every year. Uh, we can see that the next year's agenda in the economic sphere, at least, I can talk a lot about this, but the economic policy this year was primarily focused on COVID. All the countries around the globe normally focus on counter, counter cyclic economic policy. Short-term planning prevails and same thing is happening in Ukraine. In order to actually combat this short-term planning, the government is trying to develop 2030 strategy. Of course, this is a very good initiative. I really want to make it happen. And BRDO, for BRDO, this process is fully closed. We are not engaged at all. There was a decision made somewhere upstairs. But if we manage to consolidate through crowdsourcing business and government, this will be a real breakthrough because this way we're going to create an opportunity to verify the idea 
about what's going to happen if we have this strategy that will have ownership of all that have a realistic action plan attached to it with KPIs supported by government and the parliament and as the president's office as well. So this is going to be a brilliant experiment. So hopefully it, it's going to work. If you take a side view on the other things regarding our strategic developments by the government and around the government as well as all the president's office, we can nevertheless see that every month there are public conflicts happening between different government agencies, like the Simple Decisions Office. There's competition of ideas all the time. And despite the high level meetings, mi meeting minutes and uh, statements that, yeah, we made our way and we incorporated that into strategy, but the only thing remaining is to implement it. But then the implementation is, is coming and then that's where the problems start occurring with the members of parliament and different advisors. They sometimes criticize those initiatives without letting them go on and then it starts spinning. I think it's an important challenge and a success factor as well in the country's economic policy for this year and next year as well and all the following years after. So we need to actually move the focus from strategy developments to implementations. This is our joint challenge. So I think we need to start working on this all together. What are the top of the range reforms that which are not covered by the other panel discussions over this and the previous years? We can talk about IT, communications, development, um, agriculture. We can talk about agriculture here. In the development sector, we can still see major problems with the state um, construction and architectural inspection. And this is an oversight body from the state. There are well-known corruption schemes like $5 per square meter or $10 per square meter of bribes that one has to pay to be able to work. And the government is trying to fight this problem through digitalization because uh, they, they keep talking about implement, implementing the transparent digital a platform to actually eradicate corruption. Another step is to revise and finalize the organizational part of the reform in order to have a proper structure which will be able to administer the construction facilities and sites. Because construction and development has a multiplying effect. Investment in construction and development has uh, affects other industries. So this is the sphere that, of course, has to be supported, but we never found it in either of the reform visions. Also, we had big historic challenges with the construction materials. Well, there, is, there are a lot of counterfeiting products and falsified ones as well. So with the implementation of the EU regulation, there is a hope that this market will come out of the shade market and no longer will offer counterfeiting and smuggled goods, but will be working more transparencies in more transparency to incentivize economic development. In I ICT and telecommunications, we have to actually fight for human capital. In the context of the situation that is rolling out in Belarus, the government is doing a lot to facilitate immigration of the Belarusian IT professionals because they are creating a lot of added value that they are real professionals that we can bring good money to the Ukraine's economy. There are still challenges there, but we still can not cope with those, can't we? Transportation can be a real locomotive for the next year's development. There was very little progress achieved in the transportation apart from roads except for roads, and this can be a real driver for the economy. You, you, for the Ukrainian railway has to be unbundled. There has to be multiple operators uh, that have access to the market. Uh, taxi, taxis have to be legalized. We need to also um, pass the law on the inland um, river transport. I mean, this is water transport. In my response to the brief, because we're discussing it, aren't we? The brief is great. We are fully supportive of it. I think it fully reflects the real situation in the Ukraine's today's economy, in the today, uh, in the Ukraine's economy today, I'm sorry. 
Thank you. These are the couple of ideas I wanted to tell you about and share with you. Thanks very much to all the panelists. Unfortunately, um, our legislators did a bad job this year, and it normally happens in Ukraine. We should have, we have invited members of parliament here, but they never came, they never showed up. So Alexander, you're the only one who we have to ask about this. I would ask you to actually speak up once again, and after all that you've heard, what would be the top five government reforms for the next year? Because we only have one month remaining till the end of the year. Of course, this is IMF, COVID and budget. But what about the next year? What are the top five reforms? I wouldn't speak on behalf of the entire government or all of government. That's kind of dangerous. But given the today's discussion and uh, given those hot spot ideas that were expressed uh, about the state property or private property, I mean, the state owned enterprises, I'm fully supportive of uh, this statement. And not only this statement, but also this vision for the future that state uh, influence has to be reduced as well as its a presence in business. We can see how the small privatization is happening. There are thousands of auctions, 5 billion of um, hryvnia, hryvnia has, already been, has already been raised. And we know that the state-owned enterprises are poor in their efficiency. We've seen that from the slides. And only like 50% of them are working really at this time. And out of that half, another half is just profitable. The others are not. This is also pushing us to making a conclusion that we need to reduce the, the public presence in that business, in those businesses. Of course, I really love the idea that the state needs to participate in projects and not create structures inside the companies. The PPP is a really, really tangible tool. It's really working, it does work, and it's one of the best practices. And the great four experts were involved in the development of this framework. Right now, 150 plus uh, contracts were signed under the PPP. On the one hand, there is small privatization. On the other hand, we can see the number of such contracts has grown or agreements has grown. And this is kind of a shift that really demonstrates uh, not by talking, but it's a walking the talk already that in order to, in pursuit of reducing the state's presence in the enterprise operation, I think this vision will be continued as well as the practice like this. Another part has to do with deregulation. This, we definitely need to reduce the number of acts and doing business clearly showed where we are at this point. Of course, we need to do something about it. The third part, this is my personal view. And I'm sure the majority of the people will share my idea. This is the, this is fostering innovation. There is a global innovation index and Ukraine ranked second in the in, in in its category before us there is vietnam and after us there's india thanks to talents and r d this helped us rank higher but it's not the rank that should stop us from doing more we're moving in the right direction but we need to reinforce this work and never stop more focus on innovation, on innovative enterprises, high added value intellectual products, exports of technology. This is another important focus that we will be, of course, pursuing. 
these are the top three, I would say, that to my understanding it are most important ones right now. There are clear, clear cut tools to facilitate that. Some of them have already been approved, others are still in the pipeline. But there are some of the tools that can already be utilized. Number four, I would say this is transition into the digital um, world. Everything that has to be digitized must be digitized or everything that can be digitized has to be digitized. Of course, for that, we need to have reliable internet connection, a broadband internet connection. Otherwise, whatever you implement, it's not gonna work without a proper basic infrastructure. So those, those areas that I'm involved in, as well as my colleagues, we're going to start, uh, we're going to continue working hard together with businesses and uh, uh, the exporter community, always being responsive to the public opinion and, uh, and always, always actually trying to coordinate all that with the uh, government. We have almost exhausted our time, but we still have like, I don't know, a couple of minutes. But can you please quickly, like 30 seconds each, to actually tell us about the following thing. I would ask you to spend 30 seconds each to respond to one single question. And here's my question. Where is the national health of Ukraine and how can we bring it back and who will do that? You know, I think we have spent it all together and not only the state, but also the private sector. Having very ambiguous future visions, having this macroeconomic instability, we have been spending and never invested into the future. That's why we have much less human resource capital than we had years ago. I think that's a question from a different standpoint. It's the question about what we have to do now with the human potential, with the human capital. We need to bring those people back to make them attracted. Why those highly qualified people have to stay in Ukraine? That's why there is a Ukrainian startup fund. We know that many Ukrainians are coming back and start their businesses here through startups. We need to focus on how we can bring the talents back. Dimitro, how do we bring back the wealth? I fully agree the 30 years of poor action led to low economic development pace and low GDP per capita figures. We can bring it back through political will for structure, for the structural reforms. This is the only way how, how we can actually recover our, uh, our national wealth. and. Uh, uh, sprinkled by digitalization to utilize Ukraine's geopolitical transit and other potentials. Human potential will be um, uh, important in parallel with the economic development. Dovidas, how did Lithuania's, how, how have Lithuania's brought back their national wealth? Well, we, ha we had more convenient and favorable conditions since the very beginning, since the early 90s. But I should say the privatization legislation that we passed, especially land privatization, this is the law that was passed in Ukraine this March. Uh, we do not even know what's going to be the legal future of that. Hopefully it's going to come into force in July. In Lithuania and many other post-communist countries, those laws were passed like 30 years ago. So it's a big difference. Ukraine has lost a lot of time, but it's, you, it's better late than never without um, tangible and full-fledged private property there can be no future alexi so what's what's your idea about the national wealth to be brought back it can be recovered only if we convert it into conclusions and lessons learned for our society these are the lessons learned 
against populism, about ambiguous decisions. I think if Ukraine makes conclusions and considers the lessons learned, we can not only recover the wealth, but also multiply it. We indeed lost a lot of time, but if once we build strong institution, and if we keep this negative experience of the previous years in mind, then in the long run, or at least in the midterm perspective, we're going to be doing even better than our neighbors who never had this bad experience. Natalia, maybe you can share some of your advice from the diaspora side, how we, can, how, how we can bring back our national wealth. Well, it seems to me this is an internal issue. Of course, we're going to be ready to get engaged and provide any help possible to, to implement those decisions Ukraine will make. I think that's the best recipe for this. Thank you. Igor, you as the wisest man here, maybe at least you know how to bring back the national wealth. If we're talking about national wealth uh, in academic terms, oh, sorry, in economic terms, it's the value of all the resources and property that uh, had been accumulated over a certain period of time. I have two small remarks. To that part, the national wealth can be recovered. If you want to recover what we'd had before, I think it's virtually not possible to do that. Every era uh, imposes requirements to the economic growth. To be more pragmatic, of course, we need to foster economic growth and development. And it, at the end of the day, this is the combination of the internal economic policies and also taking advantage of all the opportunities that the globalized world is giving us. So we need to be together and united. We need to run economic reforms and be able to work for this purpose, for the purpose of the reforms and change. And you have to be patient enough because it's a marathon and not a sprint. When we talk less about quick wins, but and low hanging fruit, because very often this kicks us away from the strategic road. Thank you so much. Actually, I think this issue was raised not in vain. I think it was quite reasonable to ask that one from the standpoint of this attitude to reforms and balance between public and private sectors, market economy. These are the things that we've been discussing so far. And it's very good that we've reflected on getting back on track. I think I understand where this uh, rhetoric is actually coming from because Ukrainians were pretty much fooled over the last 30 years. That's why they lost a lot. And in a certain, to a certain extent, the national wealth was taken away and stolen. And even if we now bring back the national wealth again, we will see it came to zero already. So we're bankrupt. We have spent it all. Somebody got rich, very rich. Somebody, many, has gotten poor. I think we need to underline everything, and we not have, we do not have to talk about the national wealth that we used to have somewhere in the past. But let's talk about generating something new. So the economic reform agenda that we were, have been discussing from different angles here and stressed many important points. They seem to they seem to be leading to one of the same thing, maybe from different sides with different approaches. Like I, I couldn't see any ideological conflict or contradiction anywhere. I think we're all building one of the same thing. And probably this building process through the economic reforms, through market economy, through strength, through making the private sector stronger, through more efficient state and it, with its greater institutional capacity, and regulatory capacity to contribute to the public order and rule of law and not being a quasi business 
uh, actor willing to kill every business that is started. So that's the only way to recover Ukraine's, or not only recover, but generate new Ukraine's wealth. Thanks very much to all the panelists, and we will have to close at this point.
Раз, раз. Скажите что-то нам, пожалуйста. Раз, два, три, четыре, раз, два. Слышим, спасибо. Есть, слышно, да? Окей.
Доброго дня, шановні колеги, шановні учасники, шановні глядачі. Ми розпочинаємо енергетичну панель. І я з радістю представляю наших учасників. Це, по-перше, Андрій Герус, народний депутат України, голова Комітету Верховної Ради з питань енергетики і житлово-комунальних послуг. Я дякую, що ви вже другий рік підряд приймаєте участь. З нами сьогодні... Онлайн Вікторія Гриб, народна депутатка України, членкиня Комітету Верховної Ради України з питань енергетики та житлово-комунальних послуг, народна депутатка, яка досить активно участь бере у всіх енергетичних питаннях. З нами також Ольга Буславець, перша заступниця міністра енергетики України. З нами тут в залі Юлія Кириченко, співголова Ради коаліції РПР. Також з нами на онлайн-зв'язку Олена Павленко, президентка Діксі Груп, а також тут в залі Олексій Оржель, член правління Офісу ефективного регулювання Бірдіо, а також міністр енергетики і захисту довкілля 2019-2020 років. І для розминки у мене до всіх питань, до всіх, хто хоче просто дати відповідь на це питання, топ-3 пріоритети на 2021 рік – у сфері енергетики. Ну, ваші особистих там топ-3 пріоритети. Дякую за запрошення. Дякую за можливість висловити тут свої думки. Якщо говорити конкретно про топ-3 пріоритети, то, мабуть, це не в порядку з подання, а просто трійка. Це розвиток конкурентних ринків, мається на увазі лібералізація ринків, але разом із тим і з розвитку конкуренції на таких ринках. Друге – це енергоефективність. І третє – це третє, ну, я, мабуть, би до третього відніс би все, що стосується курсу Green Deal в Європі, тобто певна декарбонізація української енергетики різними інструментаріями, які в нас вже фактично є доступні завдяки розвиткам технологій. Дякую дуже. Олексій. Також дуже дякую за запрошення і можливість сказати свою думку. Я б зосередився зараз у 2021 році все ж таки на питаннях того, що у нас відбувається на ринках. І насправді ми є під загрозою локдауну, ми є в тої ситуації, коли споживач не зможе платити, буде споживати. У нас вже планується на кінець року 43 мільярди дефіциту ринку електричної енергії. У нас лібералізовані ціни на газ, проте треба ще допрацювати багато для ринку побутових споживачів, щоб вони дійсно могли змінювати постачальників, тому що, давайте відверто, ну важко бабусі змінити постачальника зараз, проте ціни великі плюс розподіл, плюс це означає не платежі, це означає все більше дефіцити, і нам треба вже думати про те, як 
реагувати на ці кризи, виявища, які точно будуть. Другий момент – це дійсно, нам треба бути актуальним з Green Deal, і, на жаль, трошки темпи ми втратили, але це не означає, що ми з нашим найбільшим партнером, сусідом і тим, хто нам допомагає, можемо бути не на одній сторінці. Дякую дуже. Чи хоче хтось з учасників, які є онлайн з нами, відповісти на це питання про топ-3 пріоритети на 2021 рік? Доброго дня, шановні колеги. Я вас вітаю. Дякую за запрошення, можливості прийняти участь в цій панелі. І дійсно погоджуюсь з колегами. Всіх сьогодні турбує те, що відбувається на ринках. І одним з пріоритетів – це все ж таки закінчити стабілізацію ситуації на енергетичному ринку, на ринку електричної енергії, по-перше, і перейти вже до питань, подальшої еволюції і лібералізації ринків, вирішення всіх проблем, які, на жаль, не були вирішені, коли ці ринки відкривались. Так чи інакше, вони тягнуть сьогодні якорям донизу і не дають все ж таки ринкам працювати, не всі це розуміємо. Я б додала до того, що не було сказано другим пріоритетом, дуже важливим, і про це я на всіх зустрічах міжнародних, на всіх рівнях зазначаю, що пріоритетом України є, по-перше, технічна синхронізація з Європейською енергосистемою МСУІ, з подальшою інтеграцією ринків, це і можливість підвищення конкуренції, і це відкриття нових шляхів для України, для розвитку наших ринків. І, зокрема, це такий драйвер того, що нам необхідно зробити в цьому напрямку. Це і до доказати нашу динамічну статичну стійкість. Для цього нам потрібно будувати маневрені потужності, без цього ми не доведемо свою самодостатню технічну спроможність бути синхронізованими. Для цього необхідні накопичувачі електричної енергії, звичайно, для балансування. І я також підтримую необхідність третього пріоритету, дуже важливим напрямком, вважаю, це енергоефективність. Тим паче, що Міненерго сьогодні дуже багато в цьому напрямку робить. І ви, мабуть, приймали участь в заходах, які були на цьому тижні присвяченому енергоефективності і чули про реформування органу агентства енергоефективності, які на сьогодні мають стати крос секторальним органам, який буде направлен, робота якого буде направлена на імплементацію всіх необхідних кроків для імплементації курсу зеленого переходу, зеленого курсу. Дякую. Дякую. Пані Дитяна, якщо можливо. Так, я просто. Давайте пані Вікторії, а потім я. Дякую, колеги. Доброго дня всім. Коли ми говоримо про пріоритети, ну, мені здається, саме важливе, що повинно бути в нас, це на сьогоднішній день все ж таки вийти з тієї кризи, в якої ми знаходимось. І в першу чергу я тут підтримую Ольгу Анатолійовну Буславець. Нам необхідно все ж таки закінчити об'єднання з НЦОІ. Сьогодні ми не можемо цього зробити, тому що в нас ще немає сертифікації оператора системи передач. І зараз ми маємо декілька законопроєктів якраз на цю тему. Я дуже сподіваюся, що вони будуть розглянуті і прийняті в найближчий час. Це по-перше. Друге, я б говорила все-таки за запровадження аукціонів. Тому що також ця проблема не вирішена, коли ми говоримо про те, що в нас потрібно все ж таки вже наводити, знаєте, такий порядок на ринку електричної енергії, без аукціонів також це, мені здається, важко робити. Але як людина-мажоритарник, я б хотіла сказати, що, знаєте, коли я знаходжуся на території, то я бачу, в якому занепаді на сьогоднішній день все ж таки знаходиться наша вугільна галузь і міста, які є монопрофільні міста і залежать від теплоенергетики, наприклад. Я вважаю, що така сама ситуація може бути і з атомщиками, і з іншими містами. Так ось, коли ми говоримо про ринки, про нові правила гри, 
то в першу чергу все ж таки потрібно подумати про ті підприємства і тих людей, які працюють сьогодні в угільній галузі, в галузі енергетики, як теплової генерації, так і атомної генерації, і зробити той justice transition, щоб ми розуміли, що потрібен той перехід. Коли ми будуємо нову модель ринку, нам необхідно сьогодні зробити все можливе, щоб зробити той перехід, щоб він не був болісний сьогодні для нашої економіки, для наших людей, в першу чергу для тих міст, які є монопрофільними. Тому я вважаю, що необхідно все ж таки зробити до кінця вже доопрацювати ту концепцію, яку розробили і Міністерство енергетики під головуванням Ольги Анатолівни, і також Міністерство регіонального розвитку прийняти ті концепції і рухатися далі. Якщо ми говоримо також про енергоефективність, то тут необхідно також працювати, це повинен бути пріоритет. Ну і зелена енергетика. Green Deal є Green Deal. Ми не можемо залишатися осторонь, ніхто нам цього не дозволить, скажімо так. Саме тому розглянути всі ті питання, які я вже озвучила, але трансформація вугільних регіонів, не тільки вугільних, а і міст з теплої генерації, якщо ми будемо вже скорочувати, то потрібно це робити в першу чергу. Дякую вам. Дякую. Олена Павленко. Так, дякую дуже. Дозвольте, я подивлюсь на пріоритети 2021 року трошки з іншого кута. Я експерт, я не представник ні парламенту, ні уряду. Мені здається, що головним пріоритетом для України в 2021 році в енергетиці є відлагодження і посилення інституційної спроможності наших органів влади, і їхній взаємодії між собою. Що я маю на увазі? Вирішити питання зі статусом регулятора. Це питання забирає дуже багато енергії, зусиль, уваги, як всередині країни, так і зовні країни. Запустити 27-й додаток. Я думаю, що зараз мені будуть казати, що він працює, але мені здається, що 27-й додаток зараз не працює так, як він був задуманий з самого початку. Такий флагман чи наступний крок в імплементації угоди про асоціацію, в інтеграції між українським і європейським енергетичним сектором. Як на мене, поки що там ще дуже багато роботи і було б добре, якби ми приділили увагу цьому питанню в 2021 році. Якщо оце потенційної спроможності і взаємодії всередині між нашими органами влади більш-менш вирішується, тоді я би пропонувала звертати увагу на три інших важливих питання. Перше питання, мені здається, варто застосувати, знаєте, говорять про смарт-показники, коли ти розробляєш стратегію, ти маєш застосувати до неї смарт-показники. Я думаю, що більшість з нас знає цю концепцію. Один із показників є межерабл. Це вимірювальний показник. Моя пропозиція, коли ми будемо наступного року, а я так розумію, наступного року ми будемо обговорювати і стратегії, і плани з енергетики і клімату, і національний внесок. Давайте ми спробуємо застосувати оцей показник вимірюваності до наших процедурів. Тільки саме це дозволить дуже чітко потім вибудувати план дій, як реалізувати. Другий пріоритет – це діджиталізація і відкриття даних. Зелений курс – це теж про це. Про те, що не треба боятися відкривати відкриття. Ми робили нещодавно рейтинг постачальників електроенергії. Ми показали, що насправді є дуже гарні приклади на ринку, коли компанії працюють відкрито і прозоро. І інші учасники ринку мають підтягуватися до цього сьогодні. Я думаю, що і органи, Влади теж мають дуже багато можливостей відкривати більше 
a lot of possibilities to open more data, and it will increase the trust in the sector and increase the, uh, the trust to the politicians as well. And of course, I don't think that the draft law should be adopted, which our NGO is advocating the, the 37 right about the opening of the product. So do not be afraid to open the information. Nothing scaring is in opening the information. And it increases the trust in the those moment, times. And the third point, one of the priorities should be the improvement of the communication between all the stakeholders. Because it's complicated to work with the Є виробника відновлювальних джерел енергії, є питання ефективного діалогу з великими державними компаніями. Це складне питання. В мене немає в мене немає зараз відповідь, як налагоджувати цю комунікацію, і як вибудовувати конструктивний діалог. Але, мабуть, велика кількість зусиль доведеться докласти і в цьому напрямку просто для того, щоб ми зосередили свою енергію на розвиток, а не на зупречки, розборки, конфлікти і колупання в законодавстві, хто правий, хто не правий. Дякую. Fighting for who is right and who is wrong. Thank you, colleagues. If we speak from the agenda point of view, we have one hour or maybe a bit uh, uh, less to speak about the most important events uh, in uh, the um, sector. So you have up to five minutes and then we have a chat where we should ask, uh, we, we should have the possibility to answer the questions. That's a question from the audience. So coming back to the general topic of the energy, and we'll start with the markets. How can we move to the, the issues at the energy market? Let's start with some positive uh, aspects. That's uh, the, uh, Retail um, energy market, uh, gas market. Uh, Alexey, how do you evaluate? Was the was it successful? This uh, liberalization of the retail market. What are the other issues? We're speaking about the gas sector. In September last year we were saying that we should follow the recommendations of IMF that this market should become competitive. And at the same time, we were speaking that a lot of work should be done, that uh, the customers who does not have this uh, digital literacy should have the, a very simple way to change the supply and and uh, those who used to be the monopolists should understand that uh, it uh, can it, it should compete uh, with others so we had the talk with uh, Milansky with uh, uh, and uh, we also spoke with uh, Obel and Erga, and it's happening step by step and it's very good that uh, we have this uh, gas private there are some processes which are happening uh, we had long talks with uh, Andrei Kobelev because he uh, believed that that's the role of uh, NAFTA gas NAFTA uh, gas should uh, be a part of the uh, retail market i have the feeling that now the uh, obel gas in regions believe uh, that it's not uh, that easy uh, to submit electronic uh, request to find this code and if we speak about Kiev, uh, 8,000 uh, degrees, uh, and now they have, I sound, uh, eight grievances. 
and also this transition, uh, this transfer fee. And people were uh, coming to me and asking how it happened this way. And so let's uh, speak uh, frankly. It's a complicated task and uh, that there are new suppliers and uh, to say how uh, it could be done. The issue is uh, that those who know about the, this topic, they know how to do it. For example, my neighbor, who is uh, uh, quite a knowledgeable person in uh, his area, and uh, he does not know how to change the supplier. And to my mind, that's a drawback. And we were willing uh, to invite the companies uh, who are close to the customers to participate uh, and uh, to give the information to the customers. So if we are speaking about the price, we have 20, uh, 28 billion. We have the storages uh, which are full. And I believe that the uh, autumn is warm. And uh, there are assessment that winter will be warm as well. So why is the, the price so high of uh, gas and why the consumer is uh, in uh, oil gas and why do they receive this high price? And then uh, that's the issue question to the anti-monopoly committee, uh, whether they are abusing the situation Speaking about the positive aspect, formally we followed the, the request of International Monetary Fund, and it's good that we are transferring this market closer to the consumers. Thank you. To summing up, I would say that last month it was more than 50 uh, suppliers. And yesterday, there were 38 companies uh, who published their proposals, and part of those companies uh, have uh, not only uh, per one month, but for three months, for nine months. And uh, the consumers should receive the information. They can uh, change uh, the supply. So how uh, the supply is different from Opel Gas, because they have one website with similar uh, symbols, uh, where is Obul Gaz and where is Obul Gaz Buddha, and people do not understand this difference. And that the information campaign can play a huge role. And also the technical assistance programs uh, could be, uh, uh, be used as well. Uh, another uh, roles of the state that at the beginning uh, there will be a, a number of uh, suppliers uh, who will become bankrupt because they will calculate the pricing in the wrong way but the state uh, should uh, control through licensing but uh, it should be a very thorough control from the state because we could receive a number of uh, vulnerable uh, consumers who will move uh, to uh, the um, suppliers who could not uh, be trusted. Uh, maybe we should use some insuring uh, tools. Uh, thanks a lot. I will recollect uh, that for those uh, consumers, who uh, lost their suppliers uh, in Ukrainian variant. They have this uh, supplier of the last hope and two months they have the guarantee that they will not uh, stay without gas and they will have the possibility to choose a new supplier. And there is a list of the suppliers already. There is no sound, sorry. I think that that's also a great question. There are also the abuses of the monopoly situation or how we call it. And that's a question to the anti-monopoly committee. 
and they can solve this in uh, different ways. So uh, I believe that we should, uh, I would like to have uh, a small uh, comment. And all the participants were speaking about the crisis in the energy sector, electricity sector, and with the uh, green energy. And we will start uh, with Andri, with uh, Olga. What are the main issues uh, which exist uh, right now and what uh, was already solved? And second, uh, what is linked? So when can we see the liberalization of this market and uh, to have it liberalized? Uh, and what happened with the gas market? And do we do understand that net that simple as we have uh, issues with uh, uh, the not uh, private house uh, holdings uh, consumptions and also the issue of uh, we should uh, speak about the increase uh, on uh, the electricity fee so there are there is a list of questions and you can answer any one which you like when you speak about the electricity market uh, and uh, when we speak of the gas market the topic is uh, similar that opening the markets of the uh, reforms are being done not just for a tip not for Vilnius but they are being conducted uh, to have this uh, fair economic mechanisms uh, for example the competition mechanism the mechanism of uh, the demand And for the opening of the gas, gas market, there are some also drawbacks, how they it's functioning or what is the competition and uh, what is about pricing. About the energy uh, market, there are some technical issues. Uh, how, ready, uh, how ready are we and how the market can be balanced and uh, the uh, services, uh, additional services uh, could uh, be provided. So if we look back uh, at uh, one year on the year and a half back, we can see that all the masses, uh, though there were different commands and our market of the energy was changing in a very similar way uh, to the European energy market. So we had warm winter and uh, the consequences, uh, as a consequence, uh, the price for energy was not that uh, high and it uh, also lowered when we had the coronavirus uh, pandemic situation and when there were a lot of generation of the renewable energy resources and similar trends we can see in European countries. Our pricing situation was, uh, I mean, our prices were a bit higher than the EU in accordance with the EU report versus the Ukraine's, uh, some of, in some of the areas, our electricity prices were higher, but it was just the first year for the market to be tested. And that's probably the most complicated one. A lot of decisions were made for the first time ever. We just had to see how they would work. And some of the those decisions were assessed afterwards to have been able to see what kind of impact there was on the market situation. The first year is always challenging in other countries from what I have analyzed so far, they even had the first inception years even more difficult than ours. Again, as for um, uh, gr uh, green energy generators, the, uh, they faced financial challenge, challenges for the last several years, our uh, feed-in tariff ca ca capacities, capacity has been grown from 2000 uh, megawatt to gigawatts and their uh, normal tariff is 4.5 hryvnia, which is a quadruple price as compared to the standard one. Of course, this 
affected the situation and uh, this huge commissioning of a lot of facilities back in 16, 17 and 18 led to huge financial gaps and uh, a lot of payables to the green uh, green uh, uh, energy sector uh, for participants. Uh, if we take the exchange rate in summer of 28, right now it is 33, I mean, euro to UAH. So there is a big financial load because there are Ukraine Energo tariffs, which is eight copics and everything on top is a quasi tax to actually pay to the to the renewable companies. And this is a really c complex challenge because the Euchre Energo tariffs has grown recently. There was one mechanism suggested to find a solution that is, uh, that's what many other countries actually do. Nevertheless, since December the 1st, the tariff for Euchre Energo will grow to 31 copics. This will generate additional funds to pay the renewables. And of course, we're going to take advantage of the uh, state guarantee mechanisms. So we want to actually reduce our indebtedness to the renewable producers. There are ideas that are currently being discussed regarding how we can change this feed-in tariff to reduce their dependency on the guaranteed buyer to be to free the market to let them actually make their money from selling their electricity but then the guaranteed buyer will be will providing compensation we're going to be discussing this with the regulator as well as with the ministry and to me there are certain good reasons and good logic which can improve the current financial situation with the indebtedness and payables and receivables that we have in the market. So we, we are going to develop, continue to develop the energy market. What's also very important from the competition standpoint, whatever it is, but we are still seeing a huge concentration of the market in belonging to several, mostly companies are concentrated in several hands. I mean, several actors are there, which is strong. And they, of course, can influence the market. They can put the market up and down. From the competition standpoint, we would encourage having more market players that are less influential in the overall situation. So there's a great job that will have to be done by the Anti-Monopoly Committee. There's a lot of work to do. I think Olga will continue and we have another speaker here who is constantly asking the same question so i'd like to forward this question to you olga to your uh, madam minister this gentleman is writing that there is constitution of ukraine there is public property and there are natural reserves why do we need the markets if maybe it's worth coming back to the old-fashioned model that used to be there when the state regulated everything and established tariffs. Why do we need this electricity and gas markets at all? Just explain this to the Ukrainian consumers. Thank you for this question. It, it is actually a very good one. Why we need markets? We need the markets in order to uh, uh, get away from this manual leverage. It was the market that was established specifically for the purpose that all the uh, market players could actually um, somehow optimize their costs, become competitive and uh, offer, make the best deals and market offerings in the marketplace. That's exactly what this, that's exactly the purpose of all these endeavors. We want to make sure the consumers are aware, they're aware of the market opportunities they can be, they can make their own assessment, what's more beneficial, what's cheaper and what's more reasonable. And therefore they can make a more well-grounded decisions uh, if the market is um, competitive enough and competition basis can actually lead to 
service quality improvements. But we haven't yet performed two very important things. We haven't got, we've gotten rid of the problems that we wanted to through the market establishment. Those are the old bad debts from the old market, which is still a burden for many generating companies and distribution companies as well, who were actually hostage by the situation. And on the other hand, we also realize how difficult it is to operate in the market environment, having such a huge subsidized market like we have, almost 50 billion Ukrainian hryvnia in, accord, in according to the different assessments, the actually subsidies that are invested into the um, residential consumer tariffs. So we need on the one hand to protect our consumers who are seeking protection, especially in the pandemic, especially if they're vulnerable. And uh, of course the situation uh, affected not only the residential consumers, but also small and medium businesses. So we, mean, we need reasonable policies to be up and running. I would also like to underline some of the positive things because a lot of talks are about the crisis. And when I came in office to serve as the minister of energy minister, there are some of the things I always wanted to tell the people about, for instance, Energo Atom. They received 2.8% of cash flow in May that they had to actually invest in their own operation. And owing to the consistent actions by government based on the energy ministry's proposals, we gradually moved this company to the bilateral agreements market and around 40%, 40% of the power they generate could be actually sold since uh, July, little by little, from a smaller share to a larger share, they could actually sell in the bilateral market. This was a positive step for the state-owned enterprises because until now, they could actually generate the turnover cash flow for six billion hryvnias because f thanks to the bilateral arrangements and agreements, and our industrial consumers could start purchasing electricity through auctions and plan their operation in a more predictable manner for themselves, because they already had understanding what kind of co costs they need to envisage for the future to make a proper operational plan. That's what the government has done. As for the renewable generation and the crisis that we'd had in spring this year, I also want to remind you about the uh, the settlements with renewable generators, 5% in May, 4% in June and 3% in July. And you know, because thanks to the efforts applied by the government, the ministry and the investors themselves who were ready to reach the compromise solution and then th thereafter, it was supported by the parliament. We, we have passed this law and actually this law was in, enforced. We can see that already in October, we're gonna settle all the 100% of the financial commitment in accordance with the memorandum that we had signed and uh, the law that the parliament had passed. The market really expected that a certain money would be allocated to perform the commitments and this helped stabilize the situation in the electricity market. I'm now sure that we're gonna have a meeting uh, at the ministry as we were instructed by the prime minister together with the regulator representatives uh, at 4 p.m. today. We're going to discuss the different scenarios of how we can financially balance the market, how we're going to live next year. The scenarios have already been developed about a month ago, and they were, first of all, discussed. Now, right now, we are adjusting those, uh, realizing the new challenges that may arise. 
So we have to take all those things into consideration. So hopefully with the close cooperation that we've had so far, when we're responsive to anyone, when we hear each other, we have the good level playing field to get to reach the compromise and find the best solution possible for all. There will not be win-win situations for all. I mean, it's always a balance, but we still have to find a solution to this in order not to find ourselves in the same trap like we'd had in the first six months this year. I'd like to share some of the information about initiatives that, that we're pushing forward. We're mostly talking about crisis and technical tactical relief exercise, but it's most important to see the future and understand where we are moving. It is our priority to actually get aligned with ENSOI. And already today we have prepared those uh, changes to the for the competitions facilitated procedures for the new generation capacities and it's very good that andre and victoria already supported the amendments to the legislation that would cut those procedures shorter i mean those competition procedures shorter and we had submitted uh, the draft law 3657 to the parliament yet in June. So please support us. And this is going to give us an opportunity to take the first uh, reliable step to actually establish a much better practice in the future. This will not only encourage power containment, but also this is going to encourage the operation of gas piston um, power stations, which have actually proven their efficiency around the world. Gas piston, I'm sorry, gas piston power stations. And uh, then we're going to we're going to balance the power grids and supplies. Uh, we will encourage even more renewable energy generation, and we will then be able to move closer to decarbonized economy. It is our attempt to actually decarbonize our economy and to further move to cleaner environment, etc. In the present day conditions, if there is lower demand for power, we will not be able to engage the basic power plants Zaporizhia NPP already started its operation tomorrow or yesterday, I'm sorry. So this will of course relieve the, the supply capacity issues we'd had before. Another important item here that I want to share with you in the nearest future with all the stakeholders we're going to discuss the uh, renewable generation support and uh, further implementation of green options will, will, will be stopped because in these critical conditions in the sector, in this generation sector, there were no reasons to do that, to, to create, to establish options. We just had to fight the fires. And we're gonna discuss the quotas and I truly expect that by the beginning of the next year, we're gonna be ready to already launch those renewable auctions or green auctions like they call it, call them. We expect this, this is going to give us an opportunity to uh, smoothen the situation with the renewables and continue to develop our renewable energy sector. The support teams will be working across the regions. And uh, of course, um, Consumers will benefit from this. I could tell you a lot of stories about energy efficiency and so many different initiatives. Thank you very much, Victoria, for mentioning the coal mining reform vision or concept paper. It's a very pressing issue for a while.
And I'm so glad that we now managed to actually put this issue up to the national level. So now the government will have to make a decision on this. You know, a lot has been done with our international partners. We're expecting this document to be approved, to be able to move forward. And uh, there are pilot projects in the pipeline. And we are now developing all the possible options to implement uh, those partnership funds or partnership fund that was proposed by the German side to engage so many international partners of ours so that this reform is not just to tick the box, but to just to bring, to bring up to tangible results, to be able to tell our people that, okay, here's the future, don't be afraid of the reform, so that the people could clearly understand that this is reform is for the people's benefit. So I think we have a lot of good results that we want to share already. So thanks very much for your restless support. Uh, um, the ministry continues to be working and everybody who's, who's supporting these endeavors will receive a lot of appreciation. And thanks very good for constructive critics because it is the construction critique that helps sometimes uh, ourselves take a different look at the situation so far. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you. And you already answered my next question actually regarding the coal mining reform. I think in the near future, we're gonna expect a concept paper or something. Uh, and after, when, once published, we will see something really specific that we will discuss later. I can see your hand, Victoria, but I would like us to, I don't know, probably get back to the renewable tariffs or, or feed-in tariffs. We know that there seems, it seems that the, there was a compromise reached between the ministry or let's say between government and uh, renewable producers but what's going on at courts at the moment? I'm just wondering to hear some of the comments from Yulia Kirichenko. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Thanks very, very much for the time. It's not actually my expertise, but why, um, why have I come here? Being an expert of the constitutional law, we have seen a threat when once we monitored submissions to the Constitutional Court of Ukraine, and why we did actually decided to tackle this issue. Apparently you all know that just recently arguable decision, uh, rulings of the Constitutional Court put the anti-corruption reform under a threat. And electronic declarations were threatened. Obviously it's not gonna make us, it's not gonna make us closer to the European Union because the conference is called the way to Vilnius. On the contrary, we now have a lot of challenges that have to be swiftly sorted through the parliament. So I'd like to take advantage of the opportunity to speak publicly here at the conference and also tell you about a threat that obviously can also take place in the renewable energy and feed in tariff reforms. We've seen that, okay, the, the constitutional court proceeding has been initiated regarding the recognition of many of the provisions of the law on alternative energy sources and electricity market void that once putting to put, put together not to share a lot of constitutional details they all have to do with the feed-in tariff which was part of our in international commitments and it it's now in the european reforms agenda trends actually if all those um, demands are actually satisfied of those members of parliament who put in doubt the feed-in tariffs. I think we're going to have huge threats in our forward-looking pursuit. And the Constitutional Court is the only institution in Ukraine that may actually uh, rule that any kind of legislation is unconstitutional. Unless provided for otherwise, the law will actually uh, 
that law will no longer be enforceable. And that specifically has to do with the power generation market. Just because of this, I have analyzed this constitutional submission and briefly will tell you about the fact that those provisions that govern um, feed-in tariffs, they cannot be considered unconstitutional. First of all, the parliament went beyond its mandate when trying to settle this through the legislative effort. It actually established the feed-in tariff and that's the function of the government and the regulator. Number two, in case the rights of the Ukrainian people are infringed, if there is the budget, uh, state budget principle is infringed as well as com competition, I will briefly provide some counter arguments for you. Is it the mandate of the parliament to govern feed-in tariffs at the level of the legislation? Our analysis has shown that actually the parliament established how this would work without mentioning the tariff itself. This was this, this uh, task was given to the independent regulator. Can the parliament regulate anything? Apparently, yes. There is a clear list of issues that the parliament can regulate. Upon the rule, the constitutional court ruling, if uh, that has to do with the internal or external national policy, the, it is the parliament mandates, unless this is clearly prescribed as an objective or part of the mandate of a different institution. In that case, this is in, in this situation, this is not the case. So we cannot see that the parliament actually um, uh, made an explicit decision in the wrong way. It's all also surprising that 24 out of 47 members of parliament that claim the law is unconstitutional. Now they vote for amendments to those laws and they never challenge uh, the issue that the parliament regulates feed-in tariffs. Does this mean that the members of parliament uh, actually violate constitutional provisions? Another one important thing about the state budget balance. I do not understand it. I cannot see how the feed-in tariff can be reimbursed from the state budget. And as for competition, there is also the, the opinion of for the court that there is no infringement of the constant of the competition principle if the state restricts or regulates any any kind of any markets in the interest of European integration or in this very case, in the interest of establishing the um, better green energy market. So not to take away a lot of time from the speakers of the panel, I'd like to once again emphasize that in our view, in the view of the constitutional law experts, that those submissions are uh, groundless. So that's why the constitutional court initiated the proceeding to actually uh, once again, confirm those provisions are quite constitutional and we have also international commitments that we need to follow. And while as we consider those provisions unconstitutional, this will lead to some of the threatening consequences for the investors and for the state budget, as well as for our international standing. Thank you. Uh, there is a brief comment from Andri Heros and then the floor will be given to Victoria Hrib. I heard that you said that the feed-in tariffs were introduced for specifically for European integration only. I heard that from your statement. Maybe I wasn't quite correct. I'm not a very big expert in the problem, but once we analyzed its constitutional submission, we've seen that there was a reference to our international commitments that after we have joined the um, energy community in 2011, so we've seen part of the international commitments. If the feed-in tariffs is our pursuit for European integration, then I think today we should have invited two Kluyev brothers who lobbied introduction 
of feed-in tariffs, and they are, as the biggest European integrators, should have taken part in the today's conference. But they were the ones that are that were most interested, had been the most interested in um, introducing feed-in tariffs. I, sh I think we should invite them both. Now, as for the situation that we have in place, there should be at least basic justice here and fair play. Reform has to bring benefits to the entire society and not just to be implemented for the sake of individuals or groups, industrial groups. A lot of European countries revisited and revised, I'm sorry, their feeding tariffs. If we even use them, they need to be adequate in size. It's not a problem that we have the feeding tariffs. There should be incentives like this. But the problem is that back in 17 and through 2011, uh, our uh, tariffs for solar generation were three times more expensive than in Germany. But then those tariffs were put down because now they were used to be linked to euros and reunion became cheaper. So we need not only to get deeper into this situation to find ways how to solve the problem in a justified and fair way. We have to remember that somebody will have to pay this money and somebody else will be getting the money. Those who are paying of course, have the right to ask whether those tariffs are justified and whether the Ukrainian citizens have to bear the burden. The reforms are focused on the Ukrainian citizens primarily, and that's why we want to develop our cooperation with the international partners. We are doing the reforms for us, for the people. I wasn't saying about whether it is reasonable to regulate or whether it is fair to regulate thing, these things by the parliament. But the only thing I wanted to say is that the constitutional court is trying to find the constitutional solution and to protect the Ukraine's constitution. So I wasn't saying that there is regulation and there is unfair condition somewhere. It is part of the parliament's mandate. That's what we wanted to check. There is no problem with any um, All the people are supposed to be paying those feed in tariffs. Well, let us stop at this point. Uh, we all understand that Ukraine has to move to the carbonless economy. And many countries introduce those feed in tariffs in different manners and ways. So we don't have a discussion on, about the feed in tariffs only here. We need somehow have to make those mistakes corrected. Uh, this is more a visionary event, not the technical one. Let me give the floor to Victoria now. She's gonna share some information about the power generation market, and then we're gonna wrap up. Thank you, Tatiana. I'd like to agree to what my colleague Andrei Heros just said with regards to the fact that we, of course, need to run the reforms, not for the sake of reforms, but to make sure the um, electricity is affordable for the Ukrainian people. And he'll, he'd also mentioned another one, another thing that today in the EU member states, their electricity is sometimes even cheaper than in Ukraine. But here I would like to once again insist, we need to push the reform agenda forward and not just take the first step without mm -hmm. taking others. I'm once again coming back to the alignment with the European energy system and SOE. Of course, we need to um, certify the uh, power distribution uh, companies as, as well as exporters and importers. If our exporters have an opportunity not only exporters but also export uh, importers if they have the same preferences like the eu market players i hope our prices will never be higher than those in the eu that's number one and number two 
I would also agree with Olena when she mentioned about the need for finding a compromise solution and consensus in the uh, energy market. Because NERC has its own policy and vision, the ministry has another one, and who's bearing the responsibility? Who's going to be accountable? It's always the ministry that is guilty. And the policies are developed and pushed forward with 90% of that, maybe I'm mistaken, but it just seems to me by the NERC. That's why in order to have fair pricing for our consumers, not the suppliers, but consumers, then here I think we need to get rid of those market speculations. And it's exactly the role that the NERC should play. Traders sometimes make money from nothing. And unfortunately, the power generation, both nuclear, thermal, and renewable, they are the ones that are mostly affected. I'm not the representative of the state institutions, and I would like to pay attention to another important issue. Ukraine should be the center of attraction of the investments. If we don't have such a factor as the markets of power supply, then why we are doing this? We will now subsidize the markets uh, um, and the uh, consumers will just consume it and uh, there will be no competition. Now uh, everyone is in the town uh, and uh, the consumption is uh, decreasing. So this dialogue uh, could be correct last year, but not this year. Thank you, Silvsi. Now I would like to join uh, to this. Uh, we believe that the Zoom uh, is not uh, joined. Uh, we have a number of comments of those who are in Zoom. So if you would allow uh, Mrs. Olga and then myself, because we are waiting for a long time. I agree with Mr. Oleksii that Ukraine uh, should be a, a attractive investment pool because uh, our power and our energy sector needs to be modernized uh, and investments. And then the key aspect, but I'm coming back to the issue. Why should we go out of this crisis uh, in this green generation without the restoring the trust of the investment? we cannot attract uh, any new investments. I want everyone to hear this. That's why all those talks, good decision or a bad decision, it's good that it's a compromise, but we should fulfill it to prove that the state of Ukraine is the, a reliable partner, that, that investors investments are secured, that uh, we are not uh, coming back uh, to the issue who adopted those decisions. We are now uh, in power, uh, in legislative, executive power to react to the challenges and to find the best solutions for our society. Thank you. Olena? Thank you. Let me come back to the topic of the gas market, and uh, they didn't have the chance to comment. I will come to be as brief as possible. We spoke about the fact that we're supporting the gas market and that we should inform the customers. Our organization is trying to inform the consumers, assisting the state in the fact, but it's not that easy. 
з рейтингом постачальників електроенергії зробити рейтинг постачальників газу. Це ще більш важливо, тому що українське споживачі населення якраз і вибирає постачальників у сфері газу. Поки що ми цього не можемо зробити, оскільки дані, які нам потрібні, є вважаються комерційною таємницею. Постачальники газу самі закривають їх, тому що це комерційна таємниця, і ребята не можуть їх надати. Ну, спробуємо, звичайно, їх отримати, але ось вам конкретний приклад, як працювати зі споживачами, якщо самі учасники ринку газу не дають можливості це робити. Або Google, наприклад, в момент, де спробуєте розмістити соціальну рекламу, Try to have some social advertising with the explanation to the consumers that we have the possibility to find a new supply. So these are very good examples that our general goals are cannot be implemented without those steps. Well, the regulator and the constitutional court. I believe that the investor will have trust to Ukraine if we won't use the political instruments for solving the economic or business investment issues in the sector. The Constitutional Court is not the tool which should regulate the market or gas or gas. Так само, як ми бачили, що сталося, коли Конституційний суд залучили до обговорення питання регуляції. Мені здається, що для нас це має бути урок надалі. Давайте вирішувати проблеми не політичними методами а тими методами, які є у прямій відповідальності прямих органів, які відповідальні за сферу енергетики. Міністерство, парламент, регулятора, третього сектору, громадських бізнесів. Next part, but we cannot uh, stop talking on this uh, topic. But uh, we hope that in 2021 we have the liberalization of market for the enterprises um, uh, who are de uh, dealing with the heating, but they have so much, uh, so many debts that. That's why I cannot even imagine how it came in a short uh, period of time. And I do not see any uh, steps to taken by the steps to have the centralized uh, power distribution. Unfortunately, maybe uh, you can tell different things but I would like to listen to your vision. What is needed to be done to have the stable situation with the enterprises? And uh, then in a few years, so we could uh, speak about the market of uh, power. And I believe that uh, and I believe that it only in several years could uh, happen. I will comment briefly and uh, will speak about the plans of a similar issue of the uh, political price uh, for uh, the um, power generators. прекрасного субсидіювання на ринку для населення з 1 квітня поточного року. Чому? then we will see uh, that uh, the gas market is saturated and uh, that the tariff will uh, have a lower part of the fuel. So how it happened? 
uh, last year. Uh, so we were trying uh, uh, to have this discount of uh, the uh, heating. And of course, uh, this uh, paying for the heat uh, energy uh, is a huge burden uh, for the suppliers, you know, for the consumers. So uh, this year we have very similar. So uh, this year, if we have the similar uh, fee uh, and the price of the gas uh, will be lower due to the warmth. So it will be the possibility to do something positive in this area. I don't see that we will have a better time uh, to change the situation in this sector. Because heating and central heating uh, are in a very bad conditions, 40% uh, uh, of losses and uh, in the householding services, it takes the uh, highest uh, level. Victoria, maybe you would like uh, to comment on the fair pricing and what can be done with the debts. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Tiana. The debts are huge. When we're speaking about uh, the improvement of the systems, and uh, those losses are more than 40%. So when we are speaking about uh, the uh, regional cities, maybe the picture is better, but when I'm speaking about the regions and districts, and we look at uh, this uh, heat supply system, people are suffering because the losses of uh, heat is more than it's allowed to be in uh, the uh, fee, but uh, this is not the responsibility of people. But we should uh, invest uh, in the modernization of the system. As usual, the investors will not come to the sector because uh, this is the debt full sector and the communal enterprises are also suffering and uh, people stopped paying for those services. But if you do not have enough funds for alimentation, how you could pay for other services? So you cannot have the possibility uh, pay for those services, which are not of the priority. So we should uh, have the programs at the national and regional levels where we could use the funds uh, to modernize those systems, because the central system of uh, heat uh, supply. So when we are speaking about some individual devices, when we are calculating, we can see that this system is the, the optimal. That's why I suggest that, and the Ministry of Regional Development to look at this issue when when in the parliament we will be adopting the budget, uh, we should uh, also have the priorities set for the heat supply, water supply. And if we will invent in modernization, then unfortunately uh, we will have a collapse of the uh, householding system. And I agree with Mr. Orchard that uh, we won't have the better period, but we won't have uh, the possibility to preserve the system which already exists. Thank you. While you were speaking, there was a comment from our, our audience that Ushkor is, is not going to use of the central heating. And I, I know that there are other cities and then there are houses or districts where some uh, only few uh, flats with the central heating. But that's are uh, the consequences of what we have. Uh, it's our treasure, this central heating system. The, everyone is saying that central heating system is uh, the best uh, heating system. We, uh, and it's depreciating all the time. 
So it's, it will be much better to innovated uh, than uh, to have individual heating systems. But unfortunately, no one is uh, making those statements from the part of the state officials. They are not talking about this, and we do not see this neither in the budget nor uh, in the programs. I see that there are comments. Uh, one comment, how can we have that Ushurt uh, is not going to use the central heating system. Uh, Ushgorod uh, refused to uh, 10 uh, years ago. So how is it uh, linked uh, with the, the fact that uh, everything is uh, deteriorated? So it's not linked with the current situation. Uh, Ushgorod uh, is not, uh, the decision of the Ushgorod uh, is not linked uh, to uh, this year. So it's a different uh, situation. So secondly, what uh, houses or districts you know, of which uh, decided not to use the uh, central heating in Kyiv or uh, in other cities for the last year, yeah, the, the heat supply is not the question of the last year, for the last two years. For the several years, there is a, a ban uh, on the uh, heat central system decline. That's uh, this could be just uh, some illegal actions, uh, and the state of the, the and the course of the state is to uh, preserve the heat uh, system. The state is going to preserve the central heating system. It's not only because uh, the Europeans are uh, telling to us this, but because we have a different climate zone, which in fact needs uh, to have this. Maybe that uh, we could have a bit uh, decentralized uh, system that we will have um, uh, the parts uh, in the districts, but not one for the city. But uh, we should preserve central heating system. And it's not possible for the cities uh, to get away of uh, this. We have cases when Nikopol uh, moved uh, to uh, power uh, heating system, and there are risks of, uh, as well. And we uh, should analyze the, the networks, whether they have the necessary capacities to have uh, this uh, power heating systems. I don't know what programs in the state budget should exist for this, but I know that the uh, householding communal enterprises uh, are uh, under the local administration. So that's the responsibility of the mayors uh, and uh, local self-governments. And after the decentralization, uh, those uh, uh, authorities uh, have higher budgets and also the budgets for development uh, grew. It's uh, complicated to imagine that uh, in Kiev we could take a decision uh, about the uh, uh, Marinka heating system or Zhidachu or Kovalevolinsk region. There is a question of the fee and the owner. Usually that's uh, the self-governance authorities. If we'll find uh, some other tools, then it will mean that it will be a, a two-way uh, subsidiaries, cross-cutting, cross-subsidizing. Uh, so some uh, uh, of the enterprises uh, could be subsidized in some cities. So uh, we are now trying to get away from the uh, cross-subsidizing. It should be direct uh, financial uh, economic logics. Then the fees uh, should uh, be based uh, on the, uh, the uh, should be economy based. Uh, but the, in 2017, we had uh, the law on the uh, householding services. Uh, so the law was uh, in a way in a, innovative uh, in the framework of the reform, but in practice, uh, the law caused a number of issues. And now searching for the possibilities to uh, solve uh, this situation. So the reforms should uh, have a positive uh, practical effect. 
that's why we have to change this situation and uh, to make the possibility uh, for the uh, power energy enterprises to function in the proper way. If they have enough funds to invest in the development or in preserving their infrastructure, then we will preserve the system of central heating. So uh, there is part of our role and uh, we uh, will adopt the necessary initiatives and also there is the role of the local um, authorities and uh, also the CEOs of those enterprises should be responsible as well. So my position is the following that the local cell guard uh, are not capable to deal with this because the modernization of the system um, requires huge funds. I don't know why Svetoslav Pavluk didn't manage to participate in our discussion, but there are some real situations that in the cities which are very progressive, they cannot attract the necessary funds to modernize the, the system. I see that Alexei is willing to comment, and to my mind, we should have the role of the state. As for the pricing of the fee, uh, and would like to explain if someone didn't understand. So the first step which should uh, happen, but it's not uh, foreseen in the law on the householding services, uh, that should be the right to conclude uh, the uh, rights to uh, the right to conclude the agreement of the uh, offer so there could be uh, the um, contract which uh, any uh, public public uh, con public offering contract uh, which any of the consumer can uh, join and that's also the reason why they are not reviewing their pricing. So, uh, Alexei and uh, then Victoria, I will just add that we have certain mythology uh, in all the topics. If we speak about central heating safety, it's uh, a most effective one when uh, at the stage of the construction. And it was constructed at the Soviet time, and that's why we have a different uh, profile of consumption. And also the system has a lower burden. That's why there are 40% of losses and it's a deteriorated one. So we're all, all the time using the system at their um, maximum point. So at some point we sh will need to, to renew the system in full. In Ozhur they had similar situation that those initiatives, which I heard in the Ministry of Regional Development, this should be the uh, plans uh, for the development of, of the central uh, heating systems. That it's also linked uh, to the development of cities and uh, the local authorities should take responsibility for this and invest in this, but we should be uh, frank that the central heating system is not efficient even if uh, our um, foreign partners are telling this because uh, an interesting comment um, in New York, the outdated uh, systems, and uh, that's why uh, they are paying too much uh, due to this historic services. Ms. Victoria, colleagues, we can talk a lot that the local authorities should. Uh, take the responsibility, but the local authorities in small cities and the middle cities and towns where there is no so many people as in Kyiv or in other regional cities, they are not capable with uh, the deficiency budgets and usually they have deficiency budgets to invest in the modernization. And when I'm speaking about, about such program as And if you yeah, uh, donor programs and uh, the of the European Investment Bank, uh, all and EBRD programs, 
And as a state, we should provide the possibility to the cities to move this issue forward. Yes, we can say that some are effective, others are not. Come to the cities. I'm now in Dobrofilia, and the system is a coal system. And if we are willing to have go from the carbon uh, economy, uh, yeah, we should uh, move to another type of fuels. So the system of uh, coal has deteriorated, uh, and also uh, there are some environmental issues. And we are not speaking about the uh, cross uh, subsidying. And from the state budget, we uh, are subsidizing the education system, the environment system. And I think this should be a separate uh, program. And for those uh, cities uh, which are suffering uh, from this issue, and I can speak about the cities which are at uh, the uh, contact line, then we should assist the, uh, the local uh, governments. Of course, they are owners of the system. The ownership should be effective. They cannot be effective owners if they do not have funds. So uh, why are you a fool? Because uh, I'm poor. And why you are a poor person? Because I'm a fool. So we should provide the state guarantees uh, for the European Investment Bank or for the funds of the ABRD. But this could be the project which will be efficient and uh, the term of the implementation will be less than people will be paying constantly. So if we do not do this, uh, this system will be a total mess and nothing uh, could be done. That's why I am addressing my colleagues, especially Andrei Mikhailovich, to support this program in this budget. Thank you. I am ready to support such a program. And there are some of the other ideas where we can actually get money from the local budgets. If we're saying that uh, local budgets have no money, in the recent years we had subsidies where the, there are non-diversified cities, they only paid 25% of the land tax, as much as that. And they still generate local taxes. If not that, I mean, the local budgets would be much richer and have much more resources. I'm sure if you're supporting uh, my, my, my proposal, then together we can generate something really good. We have just one minute remaining until the end. We haven't yet talked we talk very little about energy efficiency. And for me, any conversation about energy efficiency is about real money into the budget, which unfortunately is not there. So words are great, but more important it is to actually um, uh, do something. And with heating supplies, uh, that's very, very important. Okay, just final remarks, 30 seconds each, please. Okay, Andre, go ahead. Indeed, energy efficiency is something that we have to get involved in. And uh, we now have the energy efficiency fund. And I always raise an issue before them that they need to more involve themselves in energy efficiency and not in generation from specific sources. These are different things. Energy efficiency is about reducing consumption and not about increasing generation. On behalf of the committee, we submitted a proposal to the budget committee to actually uh, encourage more money to the those worm loans, I mean, those energy efficiency loans. And I think we need to support this state energy efficiency fund. So the draft law that we have uh, now amended it now includes provisions regarding meters in installation to actually make the energy efficiency fund more efficient and work properly with consumers who are installing uh, the meters at their own expense or the, uh, actually uh, rely on the energy efficiency fund 
to cover the costs. So it's important that the energy efficiency fund was to be efficient itself. I think the idea of establishing the fund is, was great. So we need to scale it up and continue its operation so that not hundreds of buildings are there in the program, but thousands, if not ten, dozens of thousands. So we could do everything possible not to not to stand their way on their way, but just to help them do their job. Unfortunately, yes, indeed, the resources are scared, scarce, especially this year, due to the situation that the entire world has faced. I mean, COVID nineteen. We still have budget deficit, so the budget budget capacity is now low. But anyways, there are still towns and cities. Uh, there is decentralization going on. There are municipal development budgets. So we need to make sure we work hard on energy efficiency projects. So that's the way we want to work. There are a lot of programs that are already implemented and they're up and running. So we need to scale them up and continue doing this very important thing. I'm going to be really real quick. We, we used to have actually Ministry of Energy and Environment with a priority of energy efficiency. Right now, the policy is a bit fragmented. But at the same time, if we recall last year, for instance, both the president and the parliament and the local leaders wanted to scale the energy efficient, scale up the energy efficiency fund to make it similar to the um, large development of big construction project because this way we would actually create more jobs and reduce our energy dependency but it never worked we need to of course analyze why it hasn't but that's probably the most priority thing from the standpoint of reducing adverse uh, climatic impacts but also to actually reduce to lower the bills i mean to make the, the amounts in the bills that the population pays lower. Thank you. Yeah, we've been doing this and probably the best opportunity, the best possibility to reduce your bill is by reducing consumption. I think every Ukrainian can at least reduce the bills twice if uh, energy efficiency measures are implemented. We already have cases when people just reduce their bills even to a greater extent than just double. Okay, Madam Minister, thank you. I'm going to be very concise. From our today's discussion, I once again realized that indeed what we're missing is more awareness raising and better communication with our people with the consumers of energy resources. They need to be much more aware why we're doing the reforms. And some of the key issues that have to be uh, resolved have to be communicated properly with the society so that they understand why we're doing this, what's the purpose and what they're getting from this in the end. And secondly, what was already mentioned by Olena here is the need for closer communication amongst all the branches of power to solve those extremely important issues and challenges that we have on our way. Otherwise, we will not be able to achieve the, re the results we all want for our society, for our citizens. Thanks, Victoria. Elena. Well, I can definitely tell you energy efficiency is another kind of fuel. If you don't use it, we're going to be lagging behind all the time. Sorry, you got muted. I think the connection is poor. Well, let us listen to Elena then. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm back on. Whenever we were talking about the energy efficiency fund that was created, well, unfortunately, it's not working yet. And there's a lot of money there. 
if we just reduce this red tape and stop changing the rules of the game all the time, then the fund will be up and running and people will be able to actually take advantage of those loans and grants to actually implement their energy efficiency activities and measures. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know I'll end up all uh, for the wrap up. Speaking about I energy efficiency, I would suggest to make an arrangement project. now. Let us take a small but a very important step forward together. For instance, in quarter one, let's pass the energy efficiency law to perform uh, 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 the, the EU directive. And if the parliament will be able to actually work together with the government, and with all the years of power, we will pass it. Speaking about competition, because I'm the last speaker today, and it's so nice to make a general summary, I have a very positive impression about the overall situation. Even though we have a crisis and so many problems with the pandemic and there are issues on markets and rights and rules, but the first, very first question was asked by the moderator right now about the plans for the next year, I noticed that in the vast majority of these people on this panel, they all have similar and shared similar vision for the next year. Uh, hopefully, next year we're going to join our efforts together and return to politics, I mean, leave the politics aside and start performing against the plan as our consumers want. Thanks, Solana, for this very positive, uh, positive conclusion. I think and it's very positive note, we're going to close this session. So thanks very much to all the participants. And thanks for finding uh, time in your busy schedules to actually be able to join us and in, in this discussion. And also, uh, thanks for having invited civil society. Thank you so much.
Здравствуйте, я вам позвонил вот почему. Я э, разговариваю с, с проектором с вашим, да? Вот, значит, лекции все вроде понятны. Я предложил вариант такой, чтобы не писать вот эти вот сотни вопросов всем, а сделать ну, стандартные вопросы о каждой, применить на свои, там, где он работает, он это ответил бы на эти вопросы. Ну, типа беседы состоялась бы за приемкой экзамена. Я ее отправил, она сказала, будет думать. Дело в том, что у нас же как, есть сейчас минутку поговорить? Ну, понятно, понятно, понятно. Значит, ну, у нас система же какая, у нас диалектику же никто не отменял. Знание, понимание, умение, творчество. Если мы будем давать билеты, ну, это мы только проверим, то, что я им прочитал, они это, из интернета могут эти все законы, все эти документы выловить и написать. То есть тут проблемы никаких нет. Понимание, я же хочу, чтобы знание, умение, творчество, то есть проверить, что они могут делать. Тем более, тем более, поэтому я считаю, чтобы она согласилась с моим подходом. Тем более, поскольку у вас национальный э, университет, вы имеете право утверждать, какие вы считаете подходы и методики. И вам, и вам, и вам этот, и вам, и вам ваш этот самый минвуз, так сказать, абсолютно это не указ. Вы можете согласиться, вы можете, вы можете, вы можете как эксперимент согласиться, я по этой форме возьму, и заодно хоть польза какая-то будет всем. Я согласен с каждым, я, я согласен с каждым поговорить по полчаса, по часу, и мы с ними поймем, ну хотя бы, ну, методически они напишут, как это все делать. У меня там, допустим, как, каждый пусть сделает там, допустим, управленческий аудит по своему рабочему месту или пока такому, которому он претендует. Это же нормально, он проанализирует документы. Я им помогу, расскажу методически, где что заполнил. Так, пусть напишут проект постановы Кабмина, проект приказа, ну по предприятию, проект распоряжения, проект закона, они проанализировали, да? Пусть проанализирует по своему рабочему месту, там, по ФД, там, вот это вот все. Я написал четыре вопроса, которые я им эти блоки прочитал. Я по каждому готов поговорить, они напишут, они хоть будут понимать, что они делают. Я, например, когда вот приходил на Чернобыльскую станцию, так сказать, ну, начальником, я вам Штейнбергу по такой же схеме он все сделал. Мы с ним договорились, говорит, да, работай все, сразу в мае, вот, вот что вот, пришел в этот самый министру энергетику, пришел, говорит, все окей. Кабмин пришел, с премьером поговорил, с двумя, с тремя. У меня я при трех работал, нет вопросов. Пусть эти хоть понимают, что они делают. А так, ну что, я напишу вот эти вот 40 вопросов, ну, знаете, как там. Вступительная глава там закона про электроэнергетику. Ну и что? Но пусть вы имеете, вы имеете право, можете этим правом воспользоваться, а можете, как вы знаете, этих билетов настрогать 40, и будут они там тянуть, шпаргалки писать, ну и что. Вас же никто, вас же, понимаете, в чем дело, вас же, вас же никто не проверит и никто не скажет, что у вас тут Вы взяли, решили своим этому, как ее называется, в учительской решили, как исключение сделать, и я по этой форме готов с каждым поговорить, у них хоть останется на будущее, они вот, ну, допустим, кто-то будет там каким-то начальником работать. Тем более у нас в ТФПОЕ написано, чем отличается ну, простой работник от члена Центральной комиссии, что он должен понимать, почему там так записывают, понимать и разъяснить другим людям. То есть, если они хотят быть какими-то хоть начальниками, то они обязаны эти нормативные документы не просто знать, а понимать, почему так написано. Вот мы их немножко потренируем, но ну, если не буду знать, но ну, станет им стыдно. На этом закончимся. Ну, у меня оценка, у меня оценка, 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 знаете какая, жизнь поставит им оценку. Шо, поэтому, что нам эти оценки, знаете как? То есть я хотел бы так, а так я, а так я начну вот эти все делить, это самое, знаете как. Ну и что? Пусть согласится, потому что, ну, по-другому, ну, что это будет? Мы себе заформализуем. 
Я, их, их немного, их 10 человек, я их в состоянии каждого про, прокачать. Вот. Если бы, допустим, у меня... Если бы у меня их было, допустим, сотни, то, конечно, тогда можно было на компьютер. Они там, да нет, знаете, как правило дорожного движения, и все. Ну и что толк? Давайте, поговорите, если она согласится. Если она согласится, тем более они тогда по этим четырем вопросам посидят, подумают, день-два. И мы просто обсудим то, что они напишут, и у вас останется там материал какой-то про каждому из них, который действительно будет полезным. Ну, глубина зависит от людей, которые там... Я с ней начал говорить, она пока в формальную сторону. Вот. Ну, надо же когда-то... Надо же надо сделать так, как... Ну, я просто говорю прямо. Я вот как всегда вот к новым министрам приходил, всегда по этим делам. И нормально потом работали. Не было вопросов. Все. Друг друга понимаю. И с директорами станции, когда я работал. Вот и все. Им же, они же тоже будут с кем работать. Ну, не все же время будет. Не все же время у них будет. Наверное, же когда, на, наверное, же когда-то же будут у них руководители нормальные. Когда-то. Мы так надеемся, да? А? Наверное, когда-то же будут, наверное, да? И вы, и вы должны в это верить, правильно? Хотя бы мы должны же верить. Иначе ну зачем? Вы же должны учить этих людей на будущее. Они, это, они... <смех> вот и все. Попробуйте, если вы получится, вы же ничего не теряете, вы имеете право. Скажите, эксперимент, эксперимент показал, эксперимент, да, я просто время не хочу ни свое тратить, ни их. У них нет времени, и мне вот это вот сидеть. Ну, делить это все, что я порассказывал на 177 частей, ну зачем? Хорошо. Попробуйте, если получится, давайте сделаем. И тогда у меня будет, я смогу последнюю, так сказать, ну, провести им консультацию, вот они что-то напишут, да, рассказать каждому, чем доработать вот эти все четыре ответа, а потом еще в последний день каждого примем, так сказать, ну, что они смогут, то и сделают. Каждого будет видно, что они, что они могут, что нет. Вот. Ну, и я еще раз хочу сказать, что они все эти нормативные документы, что я им рассказывал, у них вот в должностной инструкции записаны, что они должны их знать. Понимаете? Ну чего же я буду... И у них в этой в удостоверении написано, что они прошли проверку знаний, и они все это знают. Я буду что, сомнение в сиротке говорить или министру энергетики, что он, так сказать, неправильно принял у подчиненных эти экзамены? Или в Дайтеке я что? Зачем оно мне надо? Я считаю, что вы знаете, у вас есть... Вы на рабочем месте работаете, у вас в энергетике вы прошли проверку знаний. Вы все это знаете. А я хочу понять, что вы понимаете в этом знании. Вот и все. И не более того. Вы можете, если вы только за знания ставите оценку, но поставьте им 75. Если за понимание, то ну понятно, да? Но это же разные вещи. Потому что по вопросам мы можем только оценить знания. А понимание, умение это... Да, но это уже второй момент. Мы же по билетам это уже не сможем. Понимаете? Какие предлагает Наталья Петровна. Тот метод, он не позволяет вот это вот оценить, что он знает. Попробуйте. Попробуйте. Давайте сделаем, посмотрим. Пусть, пусть у них что-то будет. Поговорите с ней. Пусть она с этим согласится. Единственное, ну, можем там что-то уточнить. У вас же есть свои подходы, чтобы мы там... Да... Да, я не хочу, я не хочу тратить время ни свое, ни их на этом деле, понимаете? Да, попробуйте, вдруг у вас получится. Все, 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 спасибо, 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 да, спасибо, спасибо.
Доброго дня всім. Я думаю, ми можемо починати. Good afternoon, everybody. I think it's high time to start. My name is Konstantin Krynitsky. I'm in charge of the energy unit at the Center for Environmental Initiative, ECODIA. It is my pleasure to actually announce our third panel discussion. The key uh, part of our discussion and the topic of today is the brief, which outlined uh, key challenges and progress made in environmental protection over the last two years and the vision for reforms for the future. From my own point of view, I'm going to tell you that I work for an environmental and energy organization. I often see that environmental protection issues are not paid enough attention to. And there are much more important things that people want to discuss. But this is absolutely wrong. We have to realize that environment actually affects the population's well-being and health. Of course, we live in the times of the global pandemic. That's why environmental protection, if neglected, is something really challenging and wrong. We have here representatives of the parliament, government, international partners, and civil society to discuss this absolutely important issue. I'm going to briefly introduce our today's panelists. First of all, we have Yulia Ovchinikova, Member of Parliament, Member of Environmental Policy Parliamentary Committee, Roman Shakhmatenko, Deputy Minister of Environmental Protection and Natural Resources, Osnat Lubroni, um, Coordinator of UNDP in Ukraine, and Olena Kravchenko, uh, Executive Director of Civil Society Organization Environment Rights and Human Being, and Hanna Bashnyak, Chief of the Sector of Oversight and Control in BRD, at BRDO. Before we officially um, commence our meeting, I'd like to uh, share some of the logistical insights. We have uh, roughly one hour. We need to wrap up by quarter past three. Every panelist will be able to speak for seven minutes each, and I'm going to be um, actually watching the time. I encourage discussions among the panelists, and once panelists have any questions to any colleagues here at, the, at this panel, you're going to have time to ask your questions. After all the panelists speak, we will start the Q&A session. Also, for those who are staying with us on Zoom, you can ask direct questions through the chat function. Whenever you have any specific question to a specific panelist, then please mention who you address your question to so that then it would be easier for us to facilitate the answer. And here it is my pleasure to pass the floor to the Parliamentary Committee representative on the environmental po policy, Yulia Ovchinikova. I will probably ask two questions to you. First of all, what is your assessment of the committee's performance over the last year? What are the success stories and what's the plans and priorities the committee envisages for the next year, 2021. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. First of all, allow me to thank you very much for the invitation and thanks for paying so much attention to environmental protection issues, because for us, this is the number one priority to make sure our government and parliamentary agendas are green enough. As to your first question about my own assessment, if I want to assess it between zero to five points or zero to a hundred points, it's difficult to assess uh, ourselves because I belong to the committee and I'm involved in its operation. I would put a three out of five points because of course we should have done more and we still have a lot of work for the future. So when we analyze our performance, we're just taking the first steps. There's, those are not outcomes yet, but we're actually striving for those results. As for your second question about our success stories, among the accomplishments, we have some already. Uh, 
if we try to analyze what we've done so far. First of all, we have supported the forest inventory legislation or stock taking legislation. This is the kickstart to the reform process to in fact realize what kind of resources are available at our disposal. And then we're gonna develop the secondary legislations as the next step. So I want to, I want actually say that our first accomplishment is the first reading successfully passed on the waste management law. It is getting ready for the second reading and we are now discussing amendments within the public discussions. Also, there was the first reading uh, on the animal welfare law. Uh, we actually developing now good quality legislations in line with the Emerald Way or Way or Reserves? I don't know. Emerald Way. And uh, that's actually the answer to your questions, esteemed moderator. Can I continue? Yes, of course. Go ahead. Dear colleagues, you probably know getting ready for the today's presentation and uh, uh, statement. I just recalled my young little years. I used to talk to my dad. And we rescued so many animals and forests. We always were kept asking questions, who if not ourselves? This has become my real intrinsic value for any policy or any of my engagement. Any reform requires teamwork and professional attitude and uh, also expertise to realize what, what we're gonna have in the output. We as the committee members specifically working in a daily on a daily basis with a lot of legislative initiatives, we really realize the need for actually implementing sectoral reforms. They're vitally important. Uh, sectoral reforms are basic. It is the foundation to preserve our nature. In parallel, we have the sectoral, I'm sorry, those were horizontal reforms or flat reforms or cross-cutting ones, whatever you call it. Well, the sectoral reforms are normally focused on environmental oversight, and now it is being discussed at the committee, and it is one of the priorities for us. Because actually, these are the rules of the game on how we will protect our nature. Uh, another important fact is our international commitments and um, European integration, passing the respective directives. The subcommittee that I chair uh, we are talking about biodiversity. At the committee meetings, we initiated the, 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 to develop a strategy of preserving uh, biodiversity. And, and right now the strategy has been approved at the European Union. And we now set up a working group and we're gonna be, be actively involved in this, in this objective. Based on this strategy, we're gonna be governing the issue of invasive um, species and also protecting forestry reserves and resources with the subsequent steps. 5.7% and almost 35% of European biodiversity is located in Ukraine. An important step again is to develop, which has already been developed, the Emerald Network legislation. Very soon it's gonna be submitted to the parliament. These, those will be two different laws. And the issue of settling legislatively the Emerald networks is really important. Regarding the reserves, uh, natural reserves, you know that uh, there was a draft law passed on uh, the uh, logging uh, in at the natural reserves. This was the product of synergies between the ministries and including our ministry. We have created the working group and we have addressed all the natural reserves and parks. And now in the four subgroups, we're trying to process all those issues. The ultimate result will be quality legislative initiatives that we uh, plan to introduce at the beginning of next year. Here I wanna mention that owing to the initiative of the forestry strategy or forest strategy, our committee based on the environmental ministries platform developed the draft concept for the uh, mm, forest protection strategy. It is extremely important for us and we're planning to implement it having developed the national action plan and then the roadmaps uh, for legislative initiatives and the issue will ultimately be settled somehow. Uh, again, this national stock national stock taking reform to inventorize all those forests. Uh, what we do to protect the species, it's the first time ever in the Ukraine's parliament when we established the interfaction 
uh, parliamentary group. And we are now trying to push the steps forward in our legislative initiatives to support uh, law 2351 uh, about euthanasia of uh, the, the homeless animals. And it is the, uh, there will be uh, considered criminal offense if any violence is posed on those uh, homeless animals. We want to bring up a generation that is friendly to the wild animals and that are focused on protecting the environment. Also, the fur legislation is already in the parliament, it already passed the committee, and also, what? Uh, and we have the whole bundle of different, very important. You have one minute remaining, thank you. Uh, high profile, there was in uh, the registration and certification of the species and animals. That's, that's an important reform, but we are now communicating with the society, um, with different opinion leaders, and um, actually many EU member states had different experience in that. There is a number of waste management papers and documents we have prepared together with the reforms office. We have draft legislations developed already on the, um, on the use of the uh, um, submersive deposits. So we're working on the daily basis and work on different platforms. Well, there is a common vision that we share. I'm going to tell you about the priorities. We need to establish an agency that will be, would be protecting uh, the natural reserves and those areas to manage the emerald network areas and develop quality legislation in those areas. There is commitment, there is political will. Hopefully this would be enough. Who if not ourselves? Once again. Thank you so much, Yulia, for very comprehensive answers. It was really interesting to listen to you. I think we're going to come back to those issues once we uh, discuss and move to the Q&A. It is my pleasure to give the floor to Ruban Chakmatenko, Deputy Minister of the Envir Envir Environmental Protection and Natural R Resources. Well, this year has been quite turbulent and active. Right now, uh, the ministry had been uh, here and there. I mean, they dismantled the first one and then mounted another one. I want to focus on the progress that the ministry has made so far in the number of areas. Maybe you would start by saying about how the ministry is doing at the moment and what kind of uh, uh, activities that you're involved in and what are the priorities that you have set out for the next year. Well, first of all, allow me to extend my words of sincere gratitude for being able to participate in the today's event. Uh, regarding how the ministry is doing, yes, we were divided, and therefore we have created the new legal entity that was the initial plan. It's quite a challenging process, actually, to build everything from scratch. This is a brand new ministry with the... Uh, uh, hiring the people, opening bank accounts, rent, renting the premises. I mean, this is a huge amount of work to set everything up. Of course, it's quite time consuming and it distracts many people from um, their direct job. But thanks to the strong team and powerful minister, uh, ministers were quite outstanding. We managed to actually um, pass this process quite fast. Uh, now the, the ministry is up and running already, and not for the first month, actually. Regarding priorities, well, that's very good. How Ovchinik Ms. Ovchinikova described the situation, it's difficult to add anything else. But I would still like to briefly uh, focus on some of the priorities that we have on our agenda of the ministry and that we are, or am I, I myself, um, get involved in. Like Ms. Ms. Ovchinniko already mentioned, and I share this opinion, this is the draft law on the state environmental oversight on monitoring. We understand if the state has even an ideal environmental policy, perfect rules and regulations, it's not gonna work without effective oversight mechanism. And this is exactly why we drafted this um, state environmental oversight mechanism legislation. This work has been actually done uh, for multiple years uh, involving many civil society organizations and especially uh, environment 
law and humans. We're actively trying to actually push this process forward to make this legislation almost ideal to be successfully passed later. And actually our uh, environmental policy has become more efficient, but it's not only about monitoring and checks and inspections. It's not about the regulations, but this is also about liability, commitment and accountability because our system is out of date, yet we still have a long Soviet legacy of things. So we are now revising all the, those items now. The key. A huge part of work and a very important stop step was the, the uh, draft law on the uh, pollution by the industry and uh, that's the law which has to implement the IPPC directive of uh, 2010 775 and it will be a great shift uh, in the regulation of the industrial pollution so so best available techniques should be introduced the integrated uh, approval so the european practice in fact and everything is digitalized and uh, if we look at any of the spheres one of the key priorities is the digitalization because digitalization is the future means transparency and that's the possible forecasting and one of the key areas where we function so the administrative services through the e-system access to information through e-systems on the ecological oversight we would like to have the, the ecological inspection should uh, use the e-systems which will provide its oversight by all uh, the stakeholders, business NGOs, head of uh, the inspection. That's why this reform uh, of the waste uh, and as Mrs. Ovchinica said, and we hope that uh, it's almost at the last stage. As for the forest, that's the fight with uh, the shadow cutting, this un unbundling of the sphere. So the commercial part should be delineated with uh, the regulated one, and thus we will have the possibility to oversight this sphere better and uh, also to fight with uh, the um, black market. About the water resources, one of the key areas is uh, the reform of the aeration uh, system, irrigation system, which will allow the to attract the investments in uh, this area and uh, thus it will uh, come to uh, the next uh, level. Uh, that's just to add what Mrs. Ovchenica mentioned and I will be happy to answer any of your questions. Mr. Roman, thank you. You still even have one more uh, minute uh, and quick question. What is the ministry doing uh, to stop uh, the uh, crisis uh, uh, the climate crisis change of climate because today there was uh, the new document was presented and it's very interesting how you are cooperating with the ministry of energy just in a minute if you could answer the law was adopted on the monitoring and verification of the greenhouse uh, gas and uh, on the ozone detecting uh, and you know that there was some ozone issue with uh, ozone uh, destroying uh, elements so when we are fighting with them then we have uh, an issue with the green gas And both uh, laws were adopted, and we are going to implement those laws uh, and the, accordingly the action plans. So I'm now moving to our next speaker, 
uh, Mrs. Osan Iran. She is the coordinator uh, of the Indian project uh, of in Ukraine. I can imagine that um, you have an outsider's perspective to Ukraine. You like looking into Ukraine, and uh, for the last years, you've seen the different kinds of reforms, different legislation was passed. Um, how would you assess what's been done in the past two, two to one year, and uh, what can be done more in what areas by, Ukra by Ukrainian government? So thank you very much, and it's it's great to be on this panel where we discuss environmental protection and, and climate change indeed, because the two are very interrelated. And I, I just want to put it in the context of what uh, we globally are concerned about. And, um, you know, we are dealing now with the COVID-19 crisis, but as uh, our UN Secretary General uh, says, um, the climate change crisis is, is as uh, urgent and as important. And Ukraine, I think, has a lot to contribute on this and a lot of things to do, you know. Because of the COVID-19, I didn't travel abroad much, but I had the chance to go uh, across your beautiful country. And when I was in Western Ukraine, when I met uh, uh, members of government and civil, so the issue of flooding, you know, was really very severe this year. Likewise, I was just recently in eastern Ukraine and we saw these terrible fires in, in uh, near Severodonetsk that caused loss of life and destruction. So climate change is actually, you know, changing people's lives and it's, it's uh, to preserve the environment, of course, is, is um, one aspect, but um, there's a lot of work to do also in terms of, um, you know, to, to repair the environment with the... Uh, uh, the issue of, of flooding of mines, which is uh, again an issue that is dangerous because there, there are other, uh, different materials that can cause a, a terrible destruction. So there is a lot to do. And I, I suppose our message is that, you know, we're all concerned about this uh, pandemic, but um, again, climate change can lead to more pandemics in the future. So we need to learn now from what is happening now, not postpone things. I think the message on all of the reforms that Ukraine uh, has in front of it is, now is the time to accelerate reforms, not to go uh, backwards. And when we look at recovery, then there are a few uh, recommendations that I, I think from the global perspective that are important. So. One is to invest more in green jobs. Uh, so, you know, jobs that contribute to, to a circular economy where you, you, um, that you protect the environment and, and less destruction of, of the environment. The second is there's still a, a lot of polluting industries in Ukraine. So I think slowly to have a plan on how to graduate from these and, and do more on energy, give incentives uh, to um, energy efficiency. And I think this is happening and the UN is very pleased to work with the government on some of these uh, very important uh, initiatives. These need to go hand in hand with um, reducing uh, uh, subsidies to, to, um, to, to fossil fuel uh, 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 industries. Uh, there needs to be working together. I think the Ministry of Environment does a very important job, but it needs to be a whole of government approach. Uh, it can't be left just to the Ministry of Environment. You need the investments and the policy uh, decisions. And, and the last point is, is it's important to leave no one behind. You know, often these problems affect the, the most poor and the most vulnerable. So, so putting them first is important. Um, I think it's not easy for Ukraine because there are so many uh, other um, agendas. Uh, so I think I, what I'm hoping is this discussion is to make sure that it gets the, really the high level of, of attention. And there is an opportunity, I think, with the EU association agreement, with the um, uh, sustainable development goal commitments to make this important, you know, the Green Deal that the European Union now is trying to, to advance. Let me remind you that Ukraine signed to the Paris Agreement on um, legally binding uh, global change, uh, uh, climate change uh, 
uh, agreement that was adopted in 2015. The opportunities on the um, commitments to um, nationally determined contributions, which are at the heart of this agreement, to make them gradually more uh, ambitious. There is going to be a, a meeting in London on the 12th of December, and this will be an opportunity again to raise uh, attention to that. And, and finally, again, we are living in these um, difficult times, but uh, uh, we want to build back better, not just recover, but use this opportunity to make to become even more ambitious on very important agenda of protection of the environment and climate change in this great country. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. You also uh, came under uh, under the limit, so I will ask you a question. Um, it's it's very important for me personally also that you mentioned uh, climate change as a big big contribution for the push for re reforms in Ukraine. Uh, we can be more ambitious in our goals, uh, but I what I also um, uh, gathered from your your speech is that the recovery it must be a just recovery because um, it affects people it affects real people and the most vulnerable and this this recovery process this is maybe this um in for the government to accelerate all our remote reforms not to say okay it's COVID, it's all bad we need to stop no it's it can be used as an opportunity to be more ambitious and to think ahead to think about mm -hmm. more clean uh future for our for our country and for, for for the world also so yeah it might be not a question but like a comment that i uh, it was very important that you brought it up uh, thank you i'm passing to Hanne Bashnak uh, of the uh, oversight department of the BRDO and i would ask the following question what uh, do you what's your attitude to this sector brief how you evaluate the recommendations and indicators uh, and what is the, the uh, beer your planning uh, in the area of the environmental protection so what would you focus in your attention thank you for the question i will start with the, the statement that the brief is not reflective of the positive achievements yeah, for, of the previous year. For example, in the um, natural resources. And that's why I would like uh, to have a uh, highlight of uh, some aspects and the state policy was aimed at the rational uh, usage of the natural resources. And the state understood that the resources uh, could be exhausted, and that's why the access to them should be open and competitive. And the information about such resources should be open and accessible to the civil society. I will start with the, the, the uh, usage of uh, land. Uh, we have uh, this under policy and we had uh, the um, uh, atlas uh, that's an online tool where you could find uh, with the, uh, the lands which could be uh, leased and uh, without uh, with those atlas you can find the natural deposits which could be leased and also online data room were created that the online tools which allow to get to know the geological uh, information and uh, also we uh, have uh, registered in the parliament and last year we started fighting with uh, uh, the sleeping licenses and uh, there are 30 percent of sleeping uh, licenses in the gas sphere that's uh, the licenses which are not used for more than three years or five years or even 10 years and that the situation is limiting the proposal on the part of the state to 
uh, give uh, the uh, to suggest the, the land deposits for auctions for users. That's why those legislative initiatives are very on time, and we are supporting them. And then uh, office of effective regulation. Besides, uh, the fight with the sleeping licenses will be reflected in the new uh, reading of the code on natural resources. As you know, this code is being drafted right now at the Ministry of Environment and uh, um, of our committee. We have a working, uh, we are also part of this working group, and we do hope that this draft law uh, will be first publicly discussed and further registered in the parliament. As for the forest, the uh, law on the national inventory of words was adopted uh, to my mind it's a, a very good ecological step which would facilitate assessing uh, the uh, f number of forests in ukraine and the quality of those forests and uh, also the dynamics of the development of those forests and it will uh, allow uh, the possibility uh, to uh, have better planning in the forestry and also to use uh, our forest resources, which uh, are exhaustive resources. Um, besides, in uh, the forest sector, the um, E flow of uh, the forest was introduced, so everyone is uh, now linked to, to uh, the system and in this way we are uh, countering the black market and uh, we could also have the statistics uh, on uh, the consumption of forests uh, in the country so, and also we do not have now the direct uh, contracts which had uh, the corruption uh, corruptive risks according to the decree of the parliament uh, the sense of the effort uh, should be in a uh, transparent way uh, through uh, e bidding and that means that uh, the uh, state policy was the correct one because these uh, are the natural exhausted resources and they should be distributed and at the competitive background and the water resources it was mentioned uh, that we have the reform of aeration irrigation and we are also implementing uh, our euro integration commitments we are drafting now uh, the plans for over uh, the uh, water basins uh, um, under the uh, water framework directive and what about water bioresource uh, about the uh, fish uh, sector of ukraine last year the uh, government decided that they should be also distributed on the competitive uh, basis. And there were two pilot uh, resolutions where the, the, the quotes uh, of uh, fishing, uh, industrial fishing, should be conducted at the e uh, bidding system. And the second uh, pilot resolution that those e uh, bidding auctions the way of usage of uh, those uh, uh, fishing uh, systems uh, should be introduced. Unfortunately, the lots, uh, the bidding lots uh, were not uh, created and the auctions were not conducted. But we do hope that in the future, the government will continue this policy and those bidding lots will be created and we will see the outcomes of those experiments and also in the fishing system we have a number of issues it's a high level of illegal non-audited and non-reported fishing and the low number of fish caught and aquacultural indicators are three times uh, lower uh, than uh, we uh, have a, in the statistics. And this uh, situation in Ukraine is a negative factor because in the world there are aquaculture uh, of uh, the fish which was uh, uh, grown in uh, uh, comparing to those which uh, were caught. And in this way, uh, they can uh, oversight uh, the water basin. And uh, it's a, a very uh, good, ecologically friendly step.
But Ukraine needs to develop its aquatic culture. So one of the studies that our office has performed so far was the uh, review of the of the aquaculture in Ukraine. The positive thing is that the, the newly established ministry also has enough understanding of the range of problems and is ready to find solutions with the help of the responsible fishing code or code on fisheries. There is an open announcement on the ministry's website so any civil society organizations or citizens can read the information as well as the institutions were ready to get involved in development of such codes to solve the real problem. As for the use of the natural resources, and just a brief review from me, that's it. Um, I would also like to underline one more important thing and probably the most important one in my opinion, regarding what's going on in the environmental sector. This is about digitalization. A year ago, probably, the energy ministry, the Ministry for Energy and Environmental Protection, together with our office's experts, developed the concept paper on natural resources management. It, it used to be called an eco platform, like ecological platform. It actually had to um, describe how to manage forests or aquaculture and water basins and other resources. We actually reviewed the entire information, took stock of whatever data we have available. Then it also considered the regulatory module that would have actually um, encourage get electronic permits for the use of the resources. We also had electronic reporting module, uh, tra traceability module, and uh, the and cooperation between the state citizens and business. It's so great that this initiative was supported by the new, newly established ministry and they even broadened the scope. Now this platform has to include uh, pesticide management and agrochemicals. It all also has to incorporate emissions and wastes as well as other tools will have to be digitalized that are now managed by the ministry. So we're all for support of this digitalization and from our side, from BRDO, we are ready to help the ministry in whatever developments um, possible. So all those tools will help create much better access and non-discretion non access uh, to environmental and natural resources and will make the information to the public and transparent. Thanks very much, uh, Hannah. So we're about to finish the keynote speeches now. Unfortunately, some of the panelists could not make it here today, but uh, I would like now to ask uh, a different question from a different framework. The Green Deal. As you know, at the end of the last year, the European Commission presented the vision of the European Union's Green Deal and a vision for the European Union to become the first green continent, Europe in, in general, to become the first green continent in the world. The ministry people also had said, okay, Ukraine would also join the Green Deal of the European Union. But my question will probably go to uh, Yulia and Roman from our government, Yulia. What is being done in the parliament regarding the support for the Green Deal? I will explain my question now. Why I'm asking is that the European Green Deal is not just about environmental protection and energy. This is aimed at rebuilding the entire economy of the, all the member states. If Ukraine jumps in, then this issue like climate change and environmental protection it's not going to be the, an issue for just one or two ministries, but this will have to involve all the other actors. So, Yulia, here's my question to you in a, in a more general sense. How this environmental committee of the parliament pushes forward or at least discusses the Green Deal and what's the parliament's role in this 
entire work to be able to show that Ukraine can be ambitious enough to join the Green Deal and start fighting the climate change. Thank you for this question. This Green Deal issue is being discussed on the variety of settings by our committee, but many times it's been discussed by the environmental ministry, also based on the National Youth Council, we have been discussing the Green Deal. I absolutely agree. We need to make it participatory so that all the stakeholders are engaged in this process. Of course, it takes time. It's kind of complicated to build everything or rebuild everything. Primarily, this is d difficult to build at the right understanding and mindset. But we know that Green Deal includes so many different areas. We are taking those steps forward, for instance, to preserve our biodiversity in line with the EU key. Those are important steps, of course, uh, under the auspices of the Green Deal. It's very important to discuss this issue at, at the level of the cabinet, to then, first of all, with all the ministries, be able to establish the platform, another platform. Of course, it's going to be the environmental ministry that will take lead in the process. But to, the, a platform has to be built with Ms. Stefanishina and others to be able to take an, a holistic look at how we want to change the situation and what we will have to do. Maybe we have to generate a national action plan for this so that we clearly understand what the kind of steps have to be taken to clearly understand who's responsible for what so that a, every party in this process could see each other's role and contribution into this process. So we as an environmental policy committee are ready to actually initiate this process together with the uh, environment ministry to kickstart this process of getting aligned with the Green Deal. I'm sure we have to create this platform, but we're already taking step, steps. One of those important ones, I'm gonna say it once again, is biodiversity preservation. And I think Mr. Roman will also add something to what I've just said. Because you and the minister can also uh, make your contributions into those processes. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. Deputy Minister, I'm going to expand this question a little bit. How is this discussion going on right now at the Cabinet of Ministers and how it is coordinated with the Energy Ministry between what you do and the Energy Ministry does? Well, actually, we're all colleagues. All the energy ministry representatives and people from the cabinet and our ministry, we all understand the importance of the Green green Deal. We understand this is a Im very important and a significant step forward. This is about a, a, um, an opportunity that should not be missed due to COVID-19 situation. We need to make as many people aware of it as possible so that in a decade, we could be successful in this. We've been working on this for quite a while, actually. Even since the first day of the ministry's inception, after the Green Deal was presented in Europe, we already started doing something about it. At present, we have the ministerial working group where there's, there are business association, academia and civil society. But the main issue is how much engagement physically and realistically we will be able to show. Right now, we need to define our national contribution to the Green Deal. It's a mathematical job, most of all. It requires science and research and development that's been lasting for months now. Ms. Stavchuk, uh, that's why she she couldn't make it here today because she's exactly dealing with this issue this is our subject matters deputy minister who's involved involved in specifically green deal uh, affairs she could share more details about that but i'm going to explain from my own point of view right now consultations are held with the energy ministry and other subject matter ministries at the government level we do understand the importance of the issue and we do everything possible right now to get engaged in this initiative Hopefully, uh, 
with all the formalities and with all the procedures that have to be in place, somewhere in February or March next year, we will have the final estimates regarding the scope and the value of our contribution into the Green Deal. And I have the similar question to you. Do you plan to develop any kind of a roadmap to implement the Green Deal here? It is exactly what we're doing at this point. The, as, as we understand our contribution, then we will, of course, be able to develop the roadmap and set the responsible institutions for all those items on it, on the roadmap. Right now, I have a question to, to Ms. Lugrani. This climatic conference that is taking place in different countries this year, it was supposed to take place in Scotland, but due to COVID, they couldn't make it. In those conference, climate change conferences, sometimes very important decisions are made, like the Paris Agreement, uh, that decision was made in one of those conferences. Don't you think that failure to host the conference this year can slow all the processes down, especially for our country in its uh, climate change and environmental protection endeavors? And um, we don't have this international event this year, but um, we can still say something like the initiatives will continue. What's the overall situation right now? What's the standing at this point? So, you know, um, we are sitting here in a, as, a, as a substitute for a conference that also should have happened. And um, I think it's a good example that uh, you continue on as best as you can. I, you are right that sometimes this fora, it's there besides the formalities, there goes a lot of negotiations. Uh, I was um, very involved in, in some of the previous um, conference around climate change, and this is an intergovernmental process. And I think certainly from the UN perspective, we want to keep the ambition high. Even now, what has been agreed by member states is not high enough. So we would like to see even stronger uh, uh, commitments being made. And, uh, you know, negotiations are virtually are sometimes uh, difficult, particularly because sometimes the most important discussions happen in the corridors. So. Uh, still, I think the commitment is there by countries to participate, to contribute, to take it as seriously as possible. And so uh, let's hope that uh, the situation changes and that we can have those face-to-face -face meetings uh, very soon as well. Uh, thank you so much. And then my question goes to Hannah. Maybe you could draw the outline of how you assess civil society engagement into environmental protection affairs. What is being done at the moment and what could be done better? I'm just wondering to hear the, the colleagues of ours, because we're also part of the working groups. We're also part of the ministry meetings sometimes. Maybe you have the vision how civil society can even better contribute to this overall agenda and objectives. What kind of what other mechanisms could be engaged apart from what is being engaged already? Thank you for this question. Well, civil society is an active actor in this process, like in all other processes in this country. The whole decision making mechanisms in the mechanism in the country already incorporates the need for encouraging civil society. All the draft legislations, those and resolutions passed by the government normally have to be first submitted to public discussions. This is the procedure that is prescribed in the cabinet of ministers regulation, internal regulation. Also with the draft resolution or law, there are uh, different non-papers and explanatory notes, whatever uh, uh, extra information is provided uh, regarding the focus of the initiative, why this law is generated and is about to be passed. There is also a regulation, uh, a regulatory impact analysis that is being done. 
That is the paper that is normally developed prior to any decision made at the government or national level. There can be a lot of alternatives there. There can be 50 different alternatives discussed or just four. Nevertheless, there should be alternative solutions somehow. How we regulate things. We first identify a problem and then the government, let's say, has to realize what kind of solutions are tangible and possible. And that's exactly this paperwork that provides this information with the alternatives. They make an assessment how this kind of regulation will have an impact on business, on citizen, and on the state in general. At the present stage, once they publish draft resolutions or draft laws, one can go and read all the attached paperwork, the goals and objectives, and to see how, what kind of impact those documents will have once approved on all those aspects like civil uh, like society and people whatever these documents are not published for for no reason this is exactly to actually encourage civil society actors to get involved and i would actually ask everybody to please engage please discuss express your points of view, talk to the other peers of yours, unite yourself. And what right now they develop the Subversive Resources Code and Responsible Fisheries. It's not just happening in secret. It's not behind the doors. The information is available on all the ministry websites, all the ministries. They and make announcement of the working group meetings and everybody and anyone can actually come and uh, work with the others. Right now, the government policy is very transparent and open, so we have to get engaged and be part of the working groups. Let's discuss together the draft legis the legislations, and then the civil society will get a chance for encouraging proper changes, efficient changes that will help uh, also the country's environment. I can see Roman would, would like to also add on something. I'm just going to take a minute to share some of my personal experience here. 12 years ago, when I just started working at the Ministry of Environment, and I was a representative uh, of the Ministry at the pu Public Council, I was just 22 years old in, in those days. I was just a beginner, a rookie, and I was so impressed how civil society really influences the opinions of the others, how much influence they have on the processes inside of the ministry, and how unique this experience is. Because in our country, and I've been observing this for years, civil society, especially in environmental protection, this is something that's really, really strong. It's a really serious player and partner for the state. For instance, if we take the present situation that we are facing today, okay, let us consider anything really trivial, any activity that should incorporate environmental impact assessment, it should be verified several times. If we consider just a standard procedure, then at the stage of the environmental impact assessment, there are two officially recognized public discussions. This is regarding uh, the general awareness, then uh, proposals can be initiated from this, from the broader public and civil society. And after those are done, then we have organized normally another hearing or discussion. then we in, in invite, for instance, the state environmental inspection. So the public inspectors, uh, environmental inspectors can come over and uh, already uh, discuss something and make decisions. And then after the project is over, there should be monitoring, the afterwards monitoring, the post monitoring process. This is like monitoring and evaluation process that is encouraged. So this is a very, lengthy process that allows civil society to get engaged. There are still opportunities for improvement, but when you take other sectors or other countries' situations, 
it's already the third forum during the first day, during this day, I mean. But let's consider some of the Eastern European countries apart from Ukraine. In, the, in their, I mean, their situations, in my subjective point of view, are different. Ukraine is incomparable right now to what it had been like before. Thank you. This is Yulia Ovchinikova because she, we we're going to give her the floor because she has to go to the committee meeting now. Thank you, very, thank you very much for finding the time in your tight schedule for this intervention. Uh, I wanted to ask another question to Yulia and Roman. Uh, you just, uh, it appears that I only ask you, Roman. Uh, you just clearly stated about the success stories and about what's going on at the ministry. And in those cases, I was I always wonder to listen uh, what we already talked about what worked but what about what didn't any any failures maybe any challenges for any objective or subjective reasons can you share some of that too i would like to ask the environmental committee as well and the ministry but we no longer have the parliamentary committee representative with us let's ask the ministry official what could be done better what didn't work Thank you. Um, I wouldn't say that we have failures and um, everything, of course, uh, has a subjective perspective, but the main failure for me is the time. In fact, we would have liked to move quicker and uh, to review, to draft the draft laws, to adopt them and to implement them, but all the processes are quite time consuming. We are working on the drafting of the methodology. It's a very important task because the civil society sh and should understand how the reports should be written. So it's in fact a huge uh, part of work because they are in fact needed, but we need the institutional, um, human resources, and it takes time. We would have liked to have an additional 25th uh, hour in, uh, and uh, the eighth uh, day in the week, just uh, in brief. And my next question uh, to Ms. Avroni. I think that the question concerning the protection of environment and I, we also have questions in the chat that it uh, requires uh, huge uh, financial and human resources, and uh, it's very complicated to do it uh, in short period. So how the uh, international community and the UN, and uh, I'm sure that you communicate with the EU and other partners, other countries, so what uh, are the other tools uh, to assist Ukraine uh, in uh, the countering the climate change. Maybe this could be the technical assistance programs because we have great number of uh, issues uh, on the experts who could suggest some better solutions. For example, uh, I am working uh, with uh, this uh, coal cities and they have a very uh, low capacity uh, to change maybe uh, some funds uh, grants from the European uh, community. So certainly uh, there is a challenge of resources, but I want to say that I think what is key is partnerships. And I want to refer to what you mentioned before about the role of civil society. I mean, I think that sometimes the activism, the strength of local organizations that build that commitment, and, uh, you know, it takes courage. And we saw, you know, the, 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 that sometimes, you know, these uh, activists end up paying a high price for being so active. And uh, so I just want to underline that on the one hand, these bottoms up partnerships with uh, people that see what the impact is to get the buy-in from whole of society, but also bringing in private sector. I think more and more companies understand that if they are to remain profitable, they want to um, develop the environment and the community so that it is sustainable. If they don't think about it at all and just think about the money in the end, they will also lose. So bringing on, on board the various partnerships, you've got 
fantastic capacities in terms of expertise here in Ukraine that can not only inform the government decisions and policies in Ukraine, but can also contribute globally. You've got uh, fantastic scientists. I met some of them in, in Chernivtsi uh, uh, University. You know, uh, we had a very interesting discussion. I think next week is going to be Soil Day, which is again a very important issue that people don't think about, but preserving the quality of the soil for a country where you have potential for agricultural uh, development. Uh, all of these things, uh, you know, so there is a lot of opportunities for bringing together experts, civil society, and certainly on behalf of the United Nations, I can say, you know, we are 16 UN agencies here. We are all very, uh, all of us are driven by this issue of sustainability and the sustainable development goals. So. Um, we have different expertise to offer in different areas, uh, some of us with special one uh, expertise on the climate change and environmental um, protection, such as UNDP, the food, uh, FAO, and, and many others. So really looking forward for opportunities, again, for partnerships uh, with Ukrainians uh, to protect the environment and advance solutions to climate change. Thank you. Thank you that much for your answer. And I'm coming to the idea that partnerships are important and we are stronger when we work together on the issue. And my next question is to uh, Mrs. Ani. Ms. Avrani also uh, spoke about uh, the uh, business and responsible business. And it could be a great step if there are businesses which are functioning and their enterprises influencing in a bad way uh, our environment. And the experience uh, of European countries, there are businesses and there are legislative and bylaws which regulate the liability of businesses. And maybe uh, this uh, approach uh, could uh, help. Then uh, we will uh, move to different um, energy sources. That's why the role of business could uh, be great. So my question is, how would you characterize uh, the potential of those uh, partnerships with business in the protection of environment? What could uh, they do? Thank you for the question. Yes, uh, the attraction of business to the ecology is the area which needs uh, to be developed. Business uh, should be ecologically responsible, and those principles uh, could be achieved through the implementation uh, of the principle that the polluter pays. Also, I would like to say that now the level of responsibility is very low. For example, the uh, water bioresources and fishery. The fines which are foreseen by the Code of Administrative Offenses is very low. And so when the offenders have to pay them, so in 80%, they are paying back, but these are very small sums. But if we compare it with the, the real damages, and they are 90% higher than the fines, and uh, to recover this damage, uh, we are then uh, stopped uh, in uh, the court rulings uh, because they're not enforceable. And only 10% of uh, rulings are enforced. And the, uh, the situation is very similar in all the areas, uh, all uh, natural resources. We have to change this and to increase the liability of the offenders also there are cases when when the state ecological inspection is not allowed uh, to uh, conduct the inspection and the fine is 780 grivnas. So uh, for example, it's one of the top polluters uh, of Ukraine uh, can uh, do everything what it wants without allowing the inspection. To my mind, 
the uh, ecological liability is the area which requires a number of steps on the part of the parliament, NGO, civil society, and the cabinet of members. And a lot of attention should be paid uh, to this topic. We are ready to join the efforts to draft those uh, special bylaws. Thank you. Uh, I see that Mr. Roman is uh, willing uh, to add something. I have been uh, working for two years uh, um, on this topic and we have talked with Anna. Yes, uh, I fully agree with uh, all the statements. First of all, the uh, liability of uh, legal entities uh, is very low. The fines are funny. In 1997, uh, they, uh, they were defined in uh, 1997. Uh, so, uh, and the calculation was based on 17 uh, grievances, and so uh, those uh, fines are mm, fines uh, are main uh, assigned uh, to the uh, natural persons for, to some officials, but not to the legal entities. That's why in this uh, legislation of the oversight, we uh, included the liability of the legal entity that the administrative uh, sanctions, uh, which uh, will, uh, the legal uh, entity will incur and uh, without uh, court rulings, they should, uh, uh, they could be enforced. That I believe will change the uh, rules of the game. Yes, we have those cases when the inspections are not allowed to conduct uh, inspections. So what you can do right now, it's only to uh, submit a claim and uh, then uh, very often the state inspectors uh, are not foreseen uh, by uh, the regulations. So we are submitting now the draft law to the cabinet of ministers. And I do hope that in the nearest uh, future will be in the agenda. Secondly, the wordings which we used to uh, which used to be uh, uh, in the law, but they are still there. Uh, they are from 1997, and from the criminal code, uh, they were not changed. So we were not trying to implement the European directive on the liability on the directive on uh, the ecological crimes. We are very active uh, in drafting the necessary amendment. So we have this draft law, one uh, on the liability of legal entities. It's already in the parliament from February this year, that's on the ecological oversight. And I do hope that uh, the other draft laws will be there also soon. We have two minutes uh, and uh, I think that uh, I will uh, wrap up because the discussion was very vivid. And it's uh, great that uh, we had the representative of the parliament, of the cabinet of ministers from the uh, NGOs and our international partners. And we can see uh, what is going on because sometimes we are sitting in different corners and we are thinking that uh, something is not happening, that nothing is done. But in fact, uh, we uh, have discovered uh, that we are on the same page and uh, that uh, things are going on, of course. There are questions about the further steps. We could be more ambitious. We can set higher goals. On the other hand, it's really great that we can communicate and we can find consensus and introduce the amendments and changes which we need to protect our environment. That's why I think we have one minute. I would like to thank to all the speakers. Uh, thanks a lot. I believe that we had a very fruitful discussion. Thank you.